Dr. Akhil, welcome to the podcast. Pleasure to have you here. I want to start off with a really big picture question, which is why are we seeing such an explosion of autoimmune conditions? What the hell is going on? Yeah, thanks for having me, Drew. And that's exactly right. Um, there's a huge uh, skyrocketing epidemic of autoimmune disease. So now it affects uh, anywhere from 30 to 40 million Americans and over 300 million people worldwide. And the rates have gone up um, about like, you know, between 300 to 500 percent just in the, the past like a few few decades. Um, so just really increasing dramatically. Um, even more concerning, there was a study which looked at um, an autoimmune antibody called ANA, which is anti-nuclear antibody. That, uh, an antibody is what your immune system makes. And if it's an autoantibody, it's, it's made against your own tissue, and that's what causes autoimmune disease. So ANA is the most common antibody for autoimmune disease. And um, there uh, was a study from the NIH showed in the last um, 20 years, there's, especially in children, there's been a 44% increase in levels of ANA uh, in like children and teenagers and about 30% in adults, um, which is, um, yeah, just really, you know, really crazy. And, and scary. Yeah, it it's is. Like super scary. Yeah, yeah. And I think the, the reasons why are that um, we have now this perfect storm of conditions for autoimmunity to develop um, with the rise in environmental toxins, um, worsening infections, um, you know, the, everyone's gut microbiome is very disrupted. The food supply and our diet is off, and and then um, stress is a huge factor too. So it's an unfortunate combination of all these like kind of perfect storm of factors. Yeah, you know, you mentioned a few things. We're going to tease them all out. We're going to talk about testing and why often people are not diagnosed properly with autoimmune conditions. Yes. How a lot of people, just like we think of like pre diabetes, there's like mm -hmm. pre autoimmune. Right. You could be headed in that direction. So a lot of people yeah. are like, hey, I don't have an autoimmune condition, but it's like. Are you on your way? Yes. Based on maybe certain lab markers or other things that we can take a notice. So we're going to talk mm -hmm. about all that. But first, yep. one thing that I really loved about your book, and I'd love you to talk about it more. The book is called mm -hmm. The Tiger Protocol, mm -hmm. and I'll have you break down what tiger is. But first, T in tiger is toxins. Yeah. And you put a heavy, heavy emphasis mm -hmm. on the toxins component when it comes to autoimmune. Give us a couple reasons why you are feeling in your clinical practice, especially mm -hmm. that toxins are increasingly one of the biggest drivers of what's going on with people getting autoimmune in the first place. Yeah, I think um, in my practice, it has become kind of where I start with all with all patients, uh, and not just autoimmune. So, um, so stepping back, we know that um, there's about like forty thousand chemicals that are present and that are used in the U.S., and uh, most of them have not been studied for safety, long term safety. And many of them are associated with not just autoimmune disease, but also um, obesity. There's a, a class of toxins called obesogens, which are compounds that promote weight gain. And then there are um, diabetogens, which promote diabetes. So it's been a huge contributor to insulin resistance, diabetes, prediabetes. Um, so I think, um, you know, not just for autoimmune disease, but for chronic disease, I would actually say toxins are the single biggest unrecognized factor. Because, you know, coming from conventional medicine, we never really talk about that, you know, because it's uh, the only toxin that's really dis that was discussed during my medical training was smoking, you know, which is a, an obvious one. It, it is a big one. But this kind of like low level um, chronic exposure that all of us are continuously uh, um, accumulating it has not been studied and is not really talked about. Give us a list of some of the top toxins that are like maybe the actual molecules that you're really yes. thinking about are, are filled in some of the things that you had mentioned. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the first category is heavy metals. Um, so that uh, would be mercury, lead, arsenic, and cadmium, which are four that have been linked to autoimmunity. Um, so mercury is um, most commonly found in like fish and seafood because of um, environmental contamination of the oceans. Um, only lar like large fish, so like tuna and swordfish. Um, and then sometimes people have dental fillings that have mercury and they can get exposed that way as well. I often um, find that, yeah. you know, I'm not a physician like yourself, yep. but I'm a partner in a medical practice. And 
when I talk to our doctors there and I have a lot of functional dentists that have been on this yes. podcast, when they see somebody with a heavy mercury, mercury load, it mm -hmm. often is dental amalgam fillings that have right. cracked. Yep. We've done a couple episodes on this and have been leaching mercury back into the body in a, in a very chronic way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then, so lead is um, widespread in soils now. Um, so many foods, um, even things like certain, you know, vegetables, fruits, um, other uh, products that we consume regularly have low levels and spices. That's another big one where sometimes there can be lead that are at high levels. So um, I, that's something that our bodies never evolved to kind of cope with. And it's a, it's a new thing that at a pretty high level that they have to deal with. Um, and then um, cadmium is also another very common environment, uh, environmental toxin. And unfortunately, chocolate is one of the um, sources that is for most people because um, chocolate can be high in lead and cadmium. And so you have to seek out brands that are tested to be low. You know, I'm still eating chocolate, by the way. So Yeah, you just scared everybody. Yeah, we don't want everybody stopped. to tune out. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. And you then need... the final one, arsenic. So that's in um, drinking water is, is a supply. Like about 50 million people in the U.S. have contaminated drinking water with, um, you know, arsenic or other toxins. So I think filtering the drinking water is really important for that reason. Yeah, I think drinking water is key. And I, I think, you know, just want to touch on this a little bit because this was yeah. kind of all over the news because I think Consumer Reports did that whole study on a bunch of the top leading chocolate brands, Yes, right? Yep. And I've been studying this for a while because I've had products that are in the space, not chocolate, although I'm an investor, mm -hmm. you know, in a company that uh, sold a huge chocolate, which is one of the top oh, ones yes, that was also course. tested. Yeah. You know, the more that I've looked at it over the years, the Consumer Reports test was done on the strict California Prop 65 mm -hmm. rules that are there, which yep. are the strictest strictest uh, regulations for what um, is allowed in certain mm -hmm. things like green powders and chocolate and other stuff. But there's yep. a lot of foods. The mm -hmm. thing that I mi think that they missed, not to take us off yes. track, but yeah. I just want to add a little bit of context and nuance around the chocolate. Right. The thing that they miss is that, as you mentioned, a lot of things, anything grown in the ground yep. is going to be exposed to a certain amount of heavy metals, yes. right? So when you hear that, okay, vegetables can have heavy metals in them, like you know, sweet potatoes, mm -hmm. you know, yep. rice, things like that. Yep. You know, we're not trying to tell people don't eat those things. Yes, it has to be taken yes. within context. Right. And obviously we want to support the body's natural ability to detoxify itself. And then within yep. those heavy metals, there's organic mm -hmm. versions, mm -hmm. right? And that doesn't mean like consumer organic, but there's right. the organic compound and there's inorganic, which are yes. the industrialized versions. Correct. And I think people made a lot of fuss about the chocolate, mm -hmm. not realizing what is this compared to? Right. Because a lot right. of vegetables also have this as well. And so there's a bunch of people like, I'm not going to have chocolate anymore, mm -hmm. right? Or I'm going to have the ones that are a little bit lower tested. But I think we missed a little bit of the larger conversation yes. around it. You know, I think there's some good resources. We'll link to it out there. But these heavy metals are definitely a problem. Mm -hmm. And they're becoming more and more of a problem. Let, let's take yep. a step back, though, and tie sure. it back into autoimmune. Mm -hmm. What is it, and heavy metals are just one classification of toxins, Yes. how is it something like a heavy metal could either push somebody towards developing mm -hmm. autoimmune symptoms, or yep. if they have autoimmune condition, making it worse off? Like what's actually going on inside the body? Yeah, that's well studied now. So there's two main ways. Um, first way is with the production of free radicals. So um, heavy metals produce these compounds that are very reactive called free radicals. Um, and in the body that causes something called oxidative stress, um, which is basically cell damage and death that happens from these free radicals. And that's why um, one of the reasons that in autoimmune disease across the board, people tend to have um, low antioxidant levels. When they've looked at their blood, when they've tested their antioxidants, they're low because these toxins are using up so many of them essentially and, um, and then damaging the cells that way. Um, second way is um, through something um, kind of crazy, which is that some of these heavy metals like mercury can actually combine with our human cells. Um, they can become intracellular. They, they make these kind of what are called chimeric cells where they bond to and, and create kind of like mutant cells that are half human, half heavy metal. And uh, then, you know, you can imagine if that those are kind of floating around your body, your immune system has no idea what, what to do. We've never seen like a that. zombie and, invasion. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's literally, it's been shown like for, with mercury that 
um, that kind of chi chimeric cell uh, really causes a big immune response because it's completely foreign and the body doesn't know what to do with it. So it starts making antibodies against the cells where that is happening. Yeah. Um, it's fascinating. I didn't even know that yeah, about mercury. Yeah, I mean, there's, yeah. it's, it's, there's so many different ways that toxins can damage the body. You right. Know, yeah. Since we're on the topic of toxins, again, yeah. heavy metals was one category. Are there a couple yes. of categories of toxins that you might want to tease out a little bit and what some of the top yeah. ones are? Yeah, sure. Um, so, um, you know, in my book, I review like 20 toxins that have each been shown to raise the risk of autoimmunity. Um, so I think um, pesticides are another big category um, that includes things like glyphosate and also uh, more conventional other pesticides that are widely used in agriculture. Um, and then there are a class of chemicals called EDCs, endocrine disrupting chemicals, which are basically toxins um, that are used that disrupt your endocrine system, which is your hormone system. And that includes like BPA, it includes um, uh, PFAs, um, you know, a, a few others like that, PFCs. PFOAs, it's kind of like an alphabet soup because <laughs> once you start going through there. Um, but, um, you know, the scary thing of, uh, that I want to highlight is that there is this concept of toxin synergy, which is that uh, if you just had like, say, one toxin, then you're fine. Generally, your body can adapt to it. It knows what to do. It can, you know, body has detox capacity. So we all have the ability to clear toxins to some degree. But when they um, they're starting to study this, you know, usually they tend to isolate a variable in medical research. So you try to like just study one variable, but that's not how real life works, right? It's like hundreds of variables. So, um, for example, there was a study combined looking at um, uh, pesticides and BPA in combination had a much bigger impact than um, each of them individually mm. on like cell damage. And so it's like a one plus one equals five. You know, it's not just like one plus one equals two. There's a real kind of synergistic effect. Um, so that's why when you start um, combining, uh, you know, uh, and also you might wonder, well, um, how much does the average person really have in terms of like number of toxins, you know? Uh, so a couple of nonprofits studied um, average Americans, you know, no exposure through work or occupational hazards to toxins um, and um, just kind of like, you know, ordinary citizens. And they found about 200, uh, 200, 200 plus um, average that, that were on the, on the high side. And uh, same research has been done in, in babies, newborns, often from cord blood, umbilical cord blood, about like 200 toxins are, are detected at, at birth. And, uh, so it's, it is something that is, um, you know, uh, um, you know, we can do something about, so I don't want to like alarm people, but, um, that's the reality. Yeah. You know, I want to talk about something in the context of this, which I think is yeah. very important for people who are new to this subject. Mm -hmm. Have you know? I know you're a fan of Peter Tia and his podcast yes. and everything. Did yeah. you get his new book or have yes. you ordered it? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It's, it's great. Yeah, yeah. You know, inside of the yeah. book, he talks about how we're making the shift from medicine 2.0 to 3.0, which yes. of course functional medicine has been talking about for a long time, and integrative right. medicine as well too. Mm -hmm. There's a whole category of things. Fun, you know, medicine 2.0. You know, you could do certain trials and look at certain things and be able to know definitively what yeah. works in certain categories. Mm -hmm. Medicine 3.0, which is a lot about this personalization, is that it's actually very difficult when people say, well, hey, doesn't the government, the FDA, whatever organization, they're looking at all these toxins. They're saying, you know, what's yeah. safe and what not, what's not safe. Something like glyphosate, right? Mm -hmm. They are doing studies on it. So, and they've shown that it's yep. safe, right? That's right. how a lot of people look at it. Right. And- what they're missing a little bit inside of this is I'd love, you know, love to get your opinion on it too, mm -hmm. is that they're missing the idea that actually we have no idea what long-term exposure looks like. Mm -hmm. They underestimate the total amount of concentration, especially, especially for the vast majority of Americans who are eating ultra processed diets. Yep. There's been a lot of, there's been a couple of studies that are out there that there's a concentrated element mm -hmm. of toxins for people who are eating, the more ultra processed your diet is, fast food especially, yep. you're getting exposure to more of those toxins that are there. And then you mentioned the synergistic effect. So mm -hmm. if we were to actually do a clinical trial on something like that, it would take forever and it would yes. cost a shit ton of money, right. which is why you don't see a lot of studies. So what you have to do, and this is Peter's mm -hmm. argument, Peter Atiyah's yes. argument, is that you have to look at the best science that's available. Yeah, you have to look at your the clinical experience of 
people Mm -hmm. and you have to take a good faith leap yes and determine okay are these things going to be beneficial or Mm -hmm. should we be taking a little bit of a precautionary principle yes to some of these categories especially when it comes to things like toxins Mm -hmm. anything you want to say about that subject yeah a couple of thoughts um i think that's a very good point in terms of the you know medicine 2.0 to 3.0 um, big fan of Peter Peter Tia's work as well. Um, so I think, yeah, you're totally right in that um, long term safety is really not a, a focus of study, you know, for the um, for the government so far. Um, so of the forty thousand chemicals that are used, about two hundred have been studied for long term safety. So um, it's very uh, small number, and um, you know, it's not on the radar for uh, for a lot of a lot of people. Um, and then um, secondly, yeah, I think that. Uh, um, just having that um, um, knowledge about what you can do to reduce your toxin level, I think that's that's empowering, you know, because, uh, um, yeah, like you said, some of these um, fast foods and processed foods tend to be f- fairly high in, in these toxin levels as well. And um, that's something that is not appreciated. You know, there's other reasons why they're unhealthy, but this is a, like yet another factor. Yeah. So going back to the toxins conversation, I think the yeah. other thing that I, you know, we are going to be talking about today is one of the challenges of functional and integrative medicine is that, you know, when people read and start Mm -hmm. going through and they get diagnosed with the autoimmune condition, or they're worried about it because it runs in their family. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, And by the way, a ton of people are getting it who it doesn't run in their family. And that's a big part of what you write inside of the book. Right. Um, But let's say they have concerns that they are wanting to avoid an autoimmune condition or deal with it if they have it right now. Mm -hmm. They start looking at the level of things that they potentially have to avoid and they start to freak Mm -hmm. out a little bit, right? right? Yeah, They're like, I gotta eat perfect. I can't be exposed to any toxins. And really inside of the book, you're sharing that, look, you're gonna be exposed to things. We're just trying to minimize them. And then there are tools, lifestyle habits, et cetera, that if we do them on a regular basis, We can also manage the level of toxic load. We can better support our body's natural ability to detoxify itself, right? So I just want to jump ahead a little bit and we'll come back to kind of completing the toxins. What are a couple examples of lifestyle habits that people can do, Mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, things that we could be doing, uh, you know, working out, sauna, other stuff Mm -hmm. that you found that are supportive for people, even if they can, even if they have, which we all do, some Mm -hmm. exposure to toxins. Yeah. So I think um, actually the gut, it comes back to the gut because that is really crucial. That is how your body clears most toxins is uh, through the GI tract, um, through the liver specifically, you know, it packages toxins into what's called a bile. Then that is put into your intestine and then the bile just gets excreted uh, with the bowel movements. So um, if you're not having regular healthy elimination, you know, normal digestion, healthy bowel movements, then um, your primary way of clearing toxins is hindered. And uh, so if you're you constipated, know, for yeah, example. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And you know, because everybody's so constipated, right. I think you yeah. have to sometimes tell people what is constipation, right? Yes. Because some yes. people are like, oh, you know, I poop every other day, like that's normal. So right. what is constipation? Yeah. Right? You know, many GI doctors um, define constipation as less than three bowel movements per week, but I actually disagree with that. You that know, seems really- that, That's the medical def- That's where yeah, we that's are with crazy. Med- That's where medicine is, you know. That's, it's but... kind of like, what's obesity? The number changes <laughs> right. every year yeah, because exactly. everybody's obese. Right, right. It's so just, what would you uh, say based yeah. on your-, your uh, I would you know, say experience. one bowel movement a day. Is yeah. kind of the minimum. So at least minimum. if you're, you know, if you're not having one bowel movement a day, yeah. and a good healthy one, you have some charts inside of your book, you mm-hmm. know, of how do people can analyze right. their stool, etc., to know if it's healthy. Yeah. But you need at least one healthy bowel movement a day. If you're not, you're yep. hindering your detoxification process. Yes, that's right. Yeah, and uh, um, so I think um, that's part of what I call um, pre-tox, which is like kind of preparing your body for detox. So. Pretox includes um, healthy digestion, hydration. People forget the importance of water, but um, that is really important to make sure you're well hydrated for uh, for your detox functions to work. Um, and um, and then another system that's not often uh, emphasized is the lymphatic system. So the lymphatic system moves uh, what's called lymph fluid, which is a, a fluid that's in your whole body. 
it clears um, things like um, you know byproducts of metabolism, like lactic acid from exercise, and also clears toxins that might be throughout the whole body. And um, so ways that you can move the, the lymph are um, exercise, one of the best ways, just moving it. Lymphatic fluid is moved by muscle movement. So any type of movement will move the lymph. Um, dry brushing, which is an Ayurvedic uh, technique, you know, dry skin brushing is a very good way to support the lymphatic system. Um, and then finally, I think sweating is a really great tool. So yeah, and if we combine yeah. your first one and second one, dry brushing I see as like a bonus. If you yes, can do it, great. Yes. But really, what I'm hearing from you is if you take your first one, which is movement, yep. and you take sweating, there's another strong reason why including, you know, trying to get up and work your way up. You mm -hmm. know, you might be starting from zero, so you could even be starting with a walk or a brisk walk. Yes, but getting some sort of real. Uh, core movement practice. Yes. And if you have the basics, strength training. Right, right? for sure. So that you sweat, mm -hmm. you keep your muscle mass, and you have better metabolic health, and you're also gonna be managing all sorts of chronic diseases in a better way. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, one interesting thing about that is um, they studied the type of sweat that's produced from exercise and compared that to the type of sweat from a sauna uh, pertaining to toxins. And what they showed was um, there are actually different toxins excreted. So um, when you uh, both are good, but when you're exercising, there's like a certain subset. And if you're sweating in a way that your body's heated from an external source, um, and that could be, they actually compared like a steam sauna versus an infrared, you know, dry sauna. Um, and both the steam sauna and the infrared sauna were equally good uh, and more effective than exercise. And also were kind of um, complementary in terms of which toxins they excreted. So fundamentally, the sweating from an external heat like a sauna is different than the sweating from exercise. Both are hugely beneficial. And exercise has been like a game changer, you know, for me, my own health, my, my patients, I think that's one of the biggest levers that I, I try to work with people on. Just to parse what you said, because it yeah. almost made it sound like you were kind of preferring one of the, the other, like yeah, exercise no, or sauna, yeah. but you're saying they're both good. Yes, they're both equally good. Start wherever you can, you know, if, uh, and, uh, and and don't feel like, uh, you know, if you are um, doing both that you're kind of, um, there's anything redundant there because there's completely still additional benefit to do sauna and exercise. Yeah, we just recently had Dr. Soberg on the podcast. Yes. And her, you know, pivotal book, Winter Swimming, and her early uh, studies on uh, her early uh small in total size, but sort of flagship concept studies. Yes. Looking at all these different markers around cold therapy, but she's also a big fan of explaining to people hot therapy. And just like she calls right. herself like a thermalist, right? You know, yes. somebody like who's really teaching people how to do that. And just another reminder that like these big finished studies that have been done mm -hmm. on saunas, like you are reducing all cause mortality. Right. Through yeah. sauna. Yes. Is that one of the reasons I know you and I kind of chatted a little bit with my brother-in-law, mm -hmm. Neil, who's a cardiologist, and mm -hmm. you were telling me like you started being pretty regular about the sauna. Right. Yeah. I got one for my house and uh, that just made it much easier to do. It's just a portable small one that was a couple hundred dollars, not a, like a fancy one, but yeah. it does the job, which is basically as long as you're sweating. Um, and um, yeah, I think that has uh, really made a, made a difference for me. And just quickly, we're just going to jump around a little bit, but yeah. What is your, you know, why would you say that exercise, you know, we're both mm -hmm. Indian backgrounds, South Asian. Yep. We didn't really see a lot of people working out growing up in our immediate families. We saw people working hard. Right, right. <laughs> Not working out necessarily. I don't know yes. about you, but that was yep. definitely my case. Same. And so did that play a little bit into kind of like working out and strength training not being a regular part of your routine? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it, it's not part of um, kind of our culture and necessarily, but I think it's it's something that the the more data and research comes out, the more you know we it's transformational just to do to do exercise. And um, wherever you are, like if you're not exercising at all, starting and getting to that level of uh, you know minimal exercise, even that, like whatever step you can take in that direction, has a very profound impact on you know heart health. Um, long-term risk of chronic disease, you know, cancer risk, um, really more all-cause mortality. What do you recommend yeah. to your patients if they're starting relief from not yeah. from being very much sedentary? Mm -hmm. What is that minimal amount that you say? Or like how? Yeah. Like 
What do you recommend? How long? And what、yeah. should they be doing? So, minimum、um, I recommend is a combination of some cardiovascular exercise and some resistance training. So,、uh, minimum, you know,、uh, I recommend if they're doing cardiovascular, like just walking is a good exercise. If you're walking, I would say、um, 30 minutes at least five days a week. So, you're getting about that 150 minutes per week. That's a, a good kind of minimum to start for. Um, if you're not able to do that, then aiming for at least like 10,000 steps a day, you know, where you're tracking your steps and、uh, incorporating more walking and movement during your entire day, that's another option. And then with the resistance exercise,、uh, people can either do body weight exercises、um, where they're at home and just using their body weight for resistance.、Um, some yoga poses are、uh, in that category. Um, or they can use some simple like weights or、um, you know, other things like that. And at least twice a week is what I recommend because uh, um, it does not have to be like every day, but、um, even twice a week, there's huge benefit for resistance training. Do you ever interact and, you know, on average, right? Like, do you feel that traditionally, especially in the world of, of integrative and functional medicine,、mm -hmm. It was almost like there was too much emphasis on diet. Not that diet、yes. isn't a huge piece of autoimmune,、yep. it's, a, it's a massive piece. And、right. we're going to get into diet and you know, how to approach that and everything. But do you ever feel like diet was a little bit more overemphasized than some of these other things、mm -hmm. that are tough? You know, it's tough to、yes. do strength training on a regular basis, right? It's tough to、yes. like sweat,、yeah. mm -hmm. right? It's,、yeah. it's tough to incorporate these things. Do you feel like those were almost in a way, Minimized or overlooked for how important、yes. they were in making a difference in a patient's health. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think there was an overemphasis on diet to the exclusion of some of these other really important factors.、Um, and many of these factors are、um, really like lifestyle and behavior, you know, things like exercise and how much sleep you get and how you manage your stress.、Um, so, one thing that has been really profound in our practice is we started、um, having health coaches in our practice because as doctors, you know, we're only meeting with、um, people every couple months. But you, if you have a health coach that is checking in with you once a week, you know, on your、um, habits, on your daily behavior, it's hard to change habits. You know, it's,、uh, it's very challenging. And so having that accountability, having a coach guide you, you know, incremental change. Because a lot of that is、um, uh, within your control, you know, how much you're moving, how much you're sleeping, how you're managing your stress. But, and all of those are not diet, like you, to your point. And、uh, that's where having someone like a health coach or a nutritionist or other guide can be really useful. That's awesome. And just a quick,、yeah. quick note. You know, can people work with you? Can they work with the clinic? Like, if they're、yes. interested, they need help navigating their autoimmune condition? Yeah, absolutely. Yes.、Uh, yeah, we see a lot of people with autoimmunity, and、um, yeah, we work、uh, you know, directly with them. Oh, amazing. So we'll、yeah. put your link in the、yeah. show notes and people can reach out. Okay,、mm -hmm. let's come back. Anything more you want to say about toxins, and, and especially in the context of conventional treatments for autoimmune, right?、Yeah. Like, you know, you were trained conventionally. Yes. What did you learn at that time? About the best way to handle autoimmune conditions, even though you know that now not to be true. Like, what were you、mm -hmm. being told about how to navigate and handle autoimmune conditions? Well, I think that's the difference between conventional medicine and integrative medicine is、uh, in conventional medicine, there's never a discussion of why, there's never a discussion of like root cause. It's more like you're putting out fires, you know, which it's very good at. I mean, conventional medicine、uh, has a lot of strengths.、Um, a lot of medicines have been life saving, antibiotics can be life saving. But、um, yeah, the conventional treatment for autoimmune disease is you suppress the immune system. So the, I give patients the analogy like if your car is an immune system, then in autoimmune disease, the gas pedal is pressed way to the floor. So the car is out of control. And so in conventional medicine, we slam on the brakes. So you, you, you put them on a strong medicine to really stop the immune system steroids,、um, immunosuppressants, in, you know, injections, things that will、um, stop the, you know, the, that car. I mean, that will slow it down and、uh, stop. But then, the minute you take that away, the gas pedal is still on the floor. You know? So 
I think the, the strategy with integrative medicine and what I'm trying to convey in my book is, you know, let's take our foot off the gas. Let's look at what's driving that that car, you know, what's pushing down the accelerator. And then and then it'll be so much more effective when you use that that brake, the medicines, you know, the drugs or immunosuppressants. You can get get away with like lower dosage. You can get away with, um, you know, in some cases being able to come off them completely, but at least uh, reducing the dosage or the number of medicines needed to slow that car down. Yeah. And we're so lucky and we're thankful for all these medications that are there. But I think the yep. car analogy is great because people are like, okay, well, at least the medicine stops the car, but guess what? The car can't actually go anywhere. Right. You know, what are some right. of the downstream effects that you see from people being, you know, sort of over medicated at the absence of a lot of the lifestyle factors and components and gut health and rest and mm -hmm. toxins and infections and getting to the root of those. If they're just using medication, yep. it's not like there's no side effects from that. Right. What are some of the common, yeah. I mean, I hate to lump yep. all autoimmune oh, conditions yeah. together, mm -hmm. but a lot of the medications that people are on are immunosuppressants. Right. So yeah. what's going to happen yeah. if you are constantly suppressing your immune system? Mm -hmm. You may not have a flare up, but but what else yes. is possible? Right. Yeah. So um, I think the two classes of medicines most commonly used are steroids and then non-steroid immunosuppressants. So with steroids, things like prednisone, people have probably heard about, um, they're, they're great for short term if you have to be on it for like a, d a few days or a week or maximum a month, but some autoimmune patients have to be on prednisone for years. Um, and that's where you start to see the side effects of steroids, osteoporosis, bone thinning, um, sometimes even like necrosis of joints. Um, you see blood sugar starts to shoot up. Um, you see you're you know, kind of suppressing their immunity um, and so they're more prone to infections. So um, all those things are, 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 are side effects. And then with some of the newer medicines, which are immunosuppressants, um, like injectable medicines like Remicade or Enbrel, you don't have the same effect profile as steroids, um, but you do have greatly ris uh, increased risk of infections because you are suppressing your immune system across the board. You know, it's not selective because it's very hard to be selective with um, autoimmunity. So um, really big increased risk of infections of all types. Um, and then there is, um, with some of them, there's a long-term increased risk of cancer because your immune system plays a really big role in cancer prevention, right? I mean, we know all of us have small numbers of cancer cells. They're not harmful. Our immune system can take care of them. Um, so, but when you're suppressing your immune, that over a long time, then it reduces that surveillance, reduces the ability to detect cancer and for your immune system to take care of it like it's supposed to. That's great. Yeah. You know, you were talking about functional medicine, integrative medicine. Let's just call this this new precision medicine approach. Yes. Yeah. Is the medicine of why? Right. You're asking why? Why is this going on? Yep. Why all of a sudden are autoimmune rates skyrocketing? Mm -hmm. Because you look around and you hear from experts, and even well researched, educated experts will often just use the term genetics, right? Or it just mm -hmm. happens. But if you zoom out, even if you're not a trained physician or researcher, yeah. you're like, well, our genetics haven't changed in the last right. little bit. It takes yeah. thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of years for our genetics to, you know, really have right. that significant change. Mm -hmm. And in this medicine that you practice, you're asking why, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And obviously you've written a whole book about this approach, which we're going to continue to tease out in this podcast, but mm -hmm. even starting with that idea, yeah. what is the why that you have discovered around autoimmune conditions. Why is this happening in the body? Mm -hmm. And I know there's a few different pathways to yep. autoimmunity. So mm -hmm. I'd love for you to get a chance to talk about that. Yeah, if I had to pick the top three factors as to why autoimmunity is just getting so uh, pervasive, um, I think um, number one, I, I would uh, in, in discuss stress because I think that uh, you know the um, modern lifestyle, kind of the the way that we're all exposed to daily stress in for many different ways, is different from the way we evolved. So you know, like you were saying, human beings, um, our genes take hundreds of thousands or millions of years to uh, change, and uh, for about um, three million years, you know, we um, evolved in more of a hunter-gatherer lifestyle, you know, living outdoors and um, with uh, um, very um, low levels of stress compared to, you know, what is present now. 
because our body is well trained to adapt to stress. Low levels of chronic stress. Chronic stress, yeah, yeah. exactly. It's very well uh, adapted to acute stress. So if you have to like outrun a tiger or uh, you know fight uh, an, an, a predator, that's uh, that's great. And then after you finish, then um, you know the body has a system to relax, recover the parasympathetic. But if in our modern world there's um, constantly you know uh, that sympathetic activation, which is the fight or flight response, the stress response. Response, and there's not that um, avenue or space for the parasympathetic to come in at all. Um, and we know that is one of the um, biggest drivers because stress has been shown to be one of the triggers of autoimmune disease and also one of the main factors for exacerbation. So when someone has a flare up, most uh, it's commonly tied, linked to stress. That's one of the key factors in studies that causes, um, causes flare ups. So. Um, so I think, yeah, stress is undeniable. This is a big factor. And just one comment yeah. on stress. Yeah. You know, we didn't mention it in the beginning, but is it accurate that the vast majority of autoimmune diseases mm -hmm. are are women? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Is that accurate? Is it 80%? Yes. It's in the range of 70 to 80%. 70 80% of diagnosed yeah. autoimmune conditions are women. Yep. Yeah. There could be some diagnosis, you know, bias that's there. Women are more likely to seek out medical care, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But in general, we know it's vastly associated. And unfortunately, yep. you know, women are developing this. Mm -hmm. But in the context of stress, and this is a little bit of, you know, different people on my podcast have talked about this before. Dr. Mm -hmm. Sarah Godfrey's talked about this yes. a little bit. Dr. Gabor Mate talks about it in his new book, The Myth of Normal. Mm -hmm. Women's bodies, which are so um, attuned to nature in a way, yes. pick up earlier that something is wrong. The way that we're living is wrong. Right. And so a lot of people have said, not in their capability to handle, because women are actually really capable of handling stress, mm -hmm. but we cannot deny that stress is impacting women's bodies more so yep. because it, their bodies are more tuned to actually know when things are right and things mm -hmm. are wrong. Right. It's typically why you find, you know, women are typically starting on their spiritual journeys a little earlier than men. You know, they're yes, typically, yes. they're more into wellness. You know, they're right. looking for the answers of what's wrong and what's right. Yes. And this stress is having a major impact on them. It always gets tough anytime you talk about men, women, anything like that. But I do mm -hmm. feel we're doing an injustice if we don't highlight the fact that our modern world, in a way, is taking its toll mm -hmm. on, on women's health especially. And we need a different approach. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I think um, you know most of my practice with autoimmune patients, uh, they're women in that same range, seventy percent. Um, and uh, I think women have really unique challenges to to face in modern society. And uh, um, I think um, yeah, that that's it comes back to stress in terms of what is the driver because they experience the, that type of stress. Of so, course, and it yeah. goes a lot deeper than that. You know, there's yes. so many different elements of this. We're not trying to make this a man or a woman thing. We're right. just highlighting the yeah. fact that something's there. Great. What does that audience, what does that population need specifically and how do we need to change the approach? And also, how can we sound the alarm for clinicians? You know, there's some mm -hmm. clinicians that are listening to this podcast. Yep. How can they be better? Women traditionally have mm -hmm. felt more gaslit by their providers right. on a whole host of different things that they've been dealing with. In fact, a mm -hmm. lot of women, we had Dr. Isabella Wentz on the podcast mm -hmm. recently. She's written a lot of books on Hashimoto's, yep. a number one New York Times bestseller. And she was talking about how many women who were having almost like mental, looked like mental health type issues, mm -hmm. but it was actually undiagnosed autoimmune condition. Right. And their providers would just sort of write it off mm -hmm. or they would send them off to psychiatric care, yes. which is really effed up. Right. And they just yeah. did not know how to get to the root of what was actually impacting, mm -hmm. yep. in this case, you know, a woman's body. Yeah, the average um, person has to see five doctors before getting a correct diagnosis of autoimmune disease, and usually it takes a minimum of like four years. That's what the that is a study found. So it's very um, unfortunate, but that's a common experience. Yeah, wh why is that? And yeah. what pe can people, if somebody's suspecting that they might have an autoimmune condition mm -hmm. or they're struggling with something, anything that you can recommend to them that they can do to cut that amount of time you know, mm -hmm. down significantly so that they can get the care that they need. 
Yeah, I think that the challenge is、um, medicine. You know, we have a kind of a siloed profession where autoimmune disease is treated by the specialist in charge of your organ that's affected. You know,、um, so if it's the brain, like in MS, then you see a neurologist.、Uh, if it's your joints, like rheumatoid arthritis, you see a rheumatologist. If it's your gut, like Crohn's disease, then you see a gastroenterologist. And you know, none of them are talking to each other, so、uh, it's very siloed.、Um, Um, and uh, um, and the the thing with autoimmune disease is that these same mechanisms apply to all autoimmune diseases. There's over a hundred autoimmune diseases, so a lot of variety. But the same underlying, you know, five root causes we're talking about apply to all of them. And I think the、um, I think that what Someone with autoimmune disease really needs to do is、um, uh, connect with a provider that is interested in the why, that is interested in some of these causes. You know, maybe not all, but at least is willing to explore that together with them. And、um, more and more practitioners are are doing that because there's such a huge patient demand for that. So let's go back to your root causes. Yes, of autoimmune disease.、Yep. Stress was one. Yeah. What's the next、second. one you want to okay, talk about? Okay, so I think the second one is、uh, the gut, because、uh, um, we know the the gut is really the foundation of health for the whole body, and there are within the gut there's three main findings for autoimmune disease. So number one is a, a loss of diversity in the microbiome, which is all of the forty trillion gut bacteria that we have. And、um, diversity is one of the key metrics for health of the microbiome. So when you start decreasing and losing that diversity, then it really disrupts the ecosystem. Second factor is what's called、uh, dysbiosis.、Um, so dysbiosis is basically an imbalance in the microbiome bacteria, where you have an overgrowth of bad ones. There are some pathogenic bacteria that are too many, and then you have a decline in the beneficial bacteria, which are the keystone, the foundation of your your gut. Um, so that's dysbiosis, and then third, there's a condition called、uh, increased intestinal permeability or、uh, leaky gut syndrome.、Uh, now there's hundreds of、uh, papers about this that it's a it's a real thing, and、uh, commonly these three findings are seen in in autoimmune patients and autoimmune diseases across the board.、Um, and so working on the gut is、uh, is critical for for autoimmune health. Great, and we're going to tease out the gut. We'll talk a little bit more about stress, but right now we're giving the big picture,、yes. which these big pictures influenced your approach, the Tiger Protocol, right? right? Yeah. Okay, so we have stress, we have the gut, right? Yeah. Is there a next category or pillar、yeah. that you want to talk about? I think about? the,、um, you know, we already talked about toxins, so I think the next category、um, is the food supply. Because I, I really think diet is、uh, um, one of the biggest factors in terms of、uh, immune health, and、uh, um, that's where people have、um, some of the most power to really make changes, make different choices, and、um, have positive、uh, effects on their immune health. Got it. Diet, and、yep. we have a bunch to say about that. Yeah. So we're going to come back to that. And then the next category that's there is there is there a next one that you want to get into? Is、uh, stress, gut、yeah. toxins, which we、yeah. already talked about, diet. Yeah, and then the final one is infections,、um, mm -hmm. because those,、um, like for example,、um, viruses are well known to、uh, contribute to autoimmunity. In some cases, be some of like even triggering autoimmune conditions. So viruses are are very important.、Um, other infections have become more problematic. Like now, there's drug resistant bacteria because of all the antibiotic overuse.、Um, I think worldwide, there's、um, issues with parasites.、Uh, you know, both in in the U.S. and other countries as well. Um, and then、um, candida, which is one of the yeast or fungal organisms that is often overgrown in autoimmune disease,、um, that is also can be a big driver for inflammation and autoimmunity. So I think we do have to look at the、um, infections. But my goal is to use more of the Ayurvedic approach, which is make your body inhospitable to infections, and then a lot of them will kind of resolve、um, rather than. You know the conventional approach is what's the right drug? You know what's the right antibiotic?、What's, How do we decimate <laughs> this infection? Yeah, what's the right antiviral? What's the right antiparasitic? But instead, you know, let's look at why is your body prone to getting these infections? You know, what are some of the things you can do to make the internal environment, the ter what's called terrain, you know, of your body more inhospitable to infections? Because that is a, a big factor in autoimmunity. Great. 
you know, we chatted a bunch about toxins. You know, you mentioned the heavy metals ones, right? Yep. Do you want to mention a couple yep. of the categories that fall in the big picture of toxins? So that way we at yes. least we can wrap up that part. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I think, um, yeah, heavy metals are a big category. Then um, pesticides, so mm -hmm. including mm -hmm. um, organophosphates and, um, you know, glyphosate. Um, and then there's a big group of like kind of more um, industrial chemicals, which have made their way into like, for example, uh, perchlorate and TCE are common water contaminants in the drinking water. Mm -hmm. And both of them have been associated with autoimmunity. Uh, flame retardants, which are, you know, in California, in everything, um, are uh, because of the concern about fire. Um, they are also associated with autoimmune disease. Um, and then there's um, PFAs and uh, Teflon, which is uh, PTFO, also has been associated, like the nonstick coatings that are on pans. So I recommend, you know, not using those. Um, so those are some of the other like kind of in industrial chemicals that are present. Yeah, and just right off the bat, the best things that you can do for minimizing your, because when you go down the toxins journey, yep. even me who's been in this, Right. world of wellness for probably 20 plus years now. Yes. Every day I'm more surprised about some new thing, even something yep. that I might've been using that mm -hmm. I didn't realize right. has exposure. Yes. You know, that's there. Yep. And I don't fret about it. I don't worry yeah. about it. It's just yep. education. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. That's there. All right, let me minimize that. But I know because I work out, I do cold mm -hmm. therapy, I do hot, th I do sauna, yep. I do all these things that, and I generally am eating a clean diet. I'm not worried about the small things here and there. If I decide to make a change, I mm -hmm. obviously I don't have an autoimmune condition. I know there are people that have such uh, sensitive situations mm -hmm. that they have to be much more careful than me. Mm -hmm. But I do think going back into the stress idea is that we don't wanna get stressed out about this stuff. We wanna yes. take a measured, yes. calculated approach that's there and do our best to minimize. So right. that being said, in your book, obviously, you have a whole way of people kind of navigating that and deciding what they want to focus on first, second, third, without spending a ton of money. Mm -hmm. Would you say filtering your water is like one of the top ones to do? Yes, for sure. Yeah, I think um, filtering your water. Um, so a couple of options there. I, if you want to go with just the countertop option, like a Brita is a good place to start. In terms of the countertop filters, they've tested them and there's one called the Zero, Z-E-R-O. You know, I have no affiliation with them, but that one, same price as a Brita, but a little better at filtering lot, toxins. Honestly, I've seen them and I don't have yeah. any relationship with Zero. Yeah. I don't have any relationship with Brita. Yeah. Zero is way better. <laughs> yes, that's yeah, that's that's the one I I use. Um, and then the other option is a reverse osmosis system, which um, we got ours at Costco, uh, which is like it was about a couple hundred dollars. And um, that's one where there's a tank under your sink, and then they put a faucet there so you can get water that's uh, that's filtered. Yeah, and then people always ask, you know. Okay, reverse osmosis takes out the minerals because it also yep. takes out the toxins. All right, great. Add a little bit of minerals, add a little bit of electrolytes in first thing in the morning and get that in your water, squeeze a little lemon in, you're good right. to go. Right. Yeah. And especially, you know, here, uh, most of the, the minerals for people in the US is really in our food. So the minerals in water are more of an issue in like other developing countries where there's malnutrition and you really sure. need those small amounts of minerals. Yeah. To be we're not relying on the minerals in yeah, our water. Not here. at all. No, no. Yeah. So I, I don't have that concern about reverse osmosis. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Is there any other second or third that you think is like a no brainer when it comes to reducing your toxic load mm -hmm. that doesn't break the bank, yep. right? But as the, one of the biggest bang for the buck. Yes. Right? Yeah. So, um, so I think whenever possible, eating organic. Um, I think uh, um, you can look at the environmental working groups. Um, you know, dirty dozen, which is like the twelve foods that are highest in pesticide, and try to get those organic. Um, and they also have a list called the Clean Fifteen, which are the fifteen that have the lowest pesticide levels. And those are fine to not get organic. So that way, you're not breaking the bank. Um, and um, yeah, studies do show when you start switching to an organic diet, within like two weeks, there's a marked reduction in levels of pesticide in the urine that's measured. And this is it's pretty quick, just if you, if you can start doing that. Um, and then the third area I would say is to look at your personal care products, like the creams, the lotions, the toothpaste, all of those things. Um, now there's increasingly more like greener options available and just making sure you're having clean products to put on your skin because your skin is your biggest organ and absorbs, you know, a lot of what you put on it. 
Some people suspect this could be one of the reasons also why women have more yes. autoimmune disease is right. that typically, we just know on average, that women use you know, five to 20 times more products than men on right. average. That could be makeup, that could be all sorts mm -hmm. of different things that are part of their personal care routine. Yep. And if you're not using clean options, and definitely the clean options are not always the most affordable yes. because the dirty options are made with the cheapest ingredients and a lot of right. those are just filled with crap. Right. Yes. So we definitely have to figure out, but it's, it's good to see an explosion and mm -hmm. they're very competitive. There's a yeah. bunch of brands that are at Sephora. Mm -hmm. I know because my wife shops there and we'll pick up a okay. lot of the clean brands yep. and, and, you know, do a little bit of digging. And I think also EWG has a database called yes. the skin deep, skin deep yeah. database. So you can look at some yes. of the products that are there and see, yep. okay. So filter your water, Yep. right? Minimize your exposure to pesticides by shopping organic when you can, mm -hmm. right? Especially that dirty dozen clean 15 yep. and then moving towards cleaner personal hygiene products, makeup, et cetera, mm -hmm. stuff that you're putting on your skin. Mm -hmm. That also includes sh soap, yes. body wash, yep. shampoo, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And then one thing that was kind of surprising when I was doing the research for the book was that uh, um, shoes and the bottoms of shoes are actually, um, they track in a lot of toxins from the outside environment, from lawns and from the outdoors. And so um, just leaving your shoes like at the entrance to your house or outside uh, and not wearing them inside the house, that has been shown to reduce levels of exposure within the house. So Easy for me and you because we've been doing right. that since exactly. our whole life. Yes. Yeah, so in the Indian tradition. Another reason to justify that. Yeah. <laughs> well, a yeah. lot of traditions around the world. Yes. Uh, are, you know, are. respectful, yeah. being respectful to Asian fam Asian families, yes. a lot of uh, uh, Muslim families, you know, different groups right. and populations around the world take your shoes yeah. off outside the house. Yes. We don't want to bring in bacteria, toxins, yeah. et cetera. It's right. a respectful place. Mm -hmm. And instead yeah. walk barefoot, so which is generally another, be, Yeah. That's another zero cost uh, technique. So Yeah. That's yeah. great. And a bonus one that I throw in there, which you do talk about in your book, mm -hmm. you're gonna have a friend who's building a really beautiful house, you know, mm -hmm. here in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and he's super into health. Mm -hmm. And I was telling him, you know, um, hey, you know, if you can, there, there's some decent, good quality, not too expensive, but still, if you mm -hmm. get an air filter, it's you know generally yeah. gonna be a little bit pricey. Mm -hmm. We have one here in the office. It's called an Air Doctor. I think it's mm -hmm. great. Yeah. Um, you know, so I understand it's not accessible for everyone, but mm -hmm. there's more and more that are on the market. Just make sure you look at the specifications and everything like that. Mm -hmm. So he's building this house. He's ordering new furniture, other things. All that stuff is like heavily off-gassing, yep. right? Sure, he should be happy. He has a beautiful home. He's going to move in. He's super excited. The family's excited. But especially with young kids that are there, mm -hmm. great. Just get a couple of air filters that you know yes. are good at trying to clean the air a little bit, especially when you have new furniture mm -hmm. that is going to have fire retardants and all this other stuff that came out of good intentions, but is actually yeah. sort of slowly poisoning us as yes, well. Yes. And if you don't have an air filter, keep the windows open, right? right. Yeah, That's a exactly. low cost way to make sure. We've done a whole yes. bunch of articles mm -hmm. that I've written in my Try This newsletter, Tessa, that we can put inside of the show notes around, um, around uh, uh, PM 2.5, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And when the air quality mm -hmm. outdoor indoor reaches parts per million 2.5 this is this magic number where we know yes. it has a carcinogenic effect right in the body and mm -hmm. we're so worried about air pollution especially in a city like yes. los angeles which we should be outside yep. but the epa found that sometimes the indoor air quality mm -hmm. if people are not filtering or keeping their windows open, yes. indoor air quality can be up to 100 to 300 right. times more toxic than yes. outdoor air quality. So exactly. low cost solution, we're not here to try yes. to hear sell you a filter or anything, right. just opening your windows yeah. when you can yes. and getting that air to circulate is a good way to reduce your toxic load. And getting some house plants because house plants, plants totally. yeah, they filter the air, they remove dust, they remove toxins. So um, that's another inexpensive way to, to approach yeah. that. What was the title of this uh, article at the top? Um, Okay, so how indoor air quality impacts your brain and what to do about it. It's a great newsletter. Perfect. You can yep. find it inside the show notes. And again, yep. inside the book, you have a bunch of recommendations in that category. Okay, so to summarize, mm -hmm. we have filter your water, right? Yep. Minimize your exposure to pesticides. And I have something funny to say about that. I'm going to come back to that in a second. Okay. Um, and then the third one was... Personal care products. Personal care products. Yep. And a bonus one is, if you can, you know, be mindful of your indoor air quality, especially yep. if you have a bunch of new furniture, 
Uh, if you buy a new car, that new car smell, yes. right? Yep. That's a lot of plastic, other stuff that's mm -hmm. floating around the air. Keep the windows open, wipe the car down inside to wipe off some of that residue as much as you can. Right. And again, don't stress out, yes. do your best yep. little by little. If you stress out, that's going to be bad for your autoimmune condition. Yeah, I think the issue of mindset is very important about toxins because we want to be very clear that the goal of presenting all this research and information is not to uh, have a pessimistic outlook, you know, and not to create fear and uh, cause people to feel overwhelmed. Um, because it can be overwhelming when you look at the research, you know, so many toxins, so many things you need to do to try to avoid them. Um, it can, some people uh, lead them to feeling hopeless, you know, and so- totally. Why should yeah, I even start? Because right. I can't even begin. Yeah, exactly. Right? So I think that's um, exactly what we need to be very um, tuned into the mindset that, uh, you know, you're not going to be able to live a toxin-free life and you don't have to, you know, because your body has capacity for detox, which if you strengthen that and then do some targeted things to reduce your exposure, that's all we're talking about here. Yeah. The funny thing that I was going to mention is that, you know, there's constant propaganda that's out there. And mm -hmm. I do believe that even some of these individuals, some are nefarious, but some feel like they're trying to take a more evidence-based approach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm good friends and, you know, uh, with Vani Hari, the food babe, who has done mm -hmm. a lot of education of toxins over the years, right? Mm -hmm. And done some big campaigns to get Chick-fil-A, Subway, other things to remove very harmful chemicals yep. yes. out of their foods. And even places like Kraft in America, mm -hmm. Kraft has a bunch of ingredients that they allow, right. but then in the European Union, they don't, they don't allow that because there's stricter, me stricter measures, the precautionary mm -hmm. principles. So she's gotten her army, the Food Babe army together to put pressure on these companies yep. and say like, hey, look, we demand that you clean these things up. And she's been very successful. Yes. So in uh, retaliation or in uh, uh, as a response to her, there's an, another woman who I believe is associated with the ag company. And she mm. wrote an article recently. Uh, Tessa, let's see if we can find it. Search ag daily, A-G daily, ag mm. daily, food science babe. And dirty dozen. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, people are constantly being hit with mm -hmm. different propaganda mm -hmm. that's out there. And so, yeah, click on the first article here. So, th this is a slight at uh, the Environmental Working Group, yep. right? People can read it. I'm, I'm a big yeah. fan of making sure that people understand the other side of the argument sure. that's there, yep. right? Mm -hmm. And and get it. And I also want to make sure I understand it, yes, so that I can understand where they're coming from, and and see if number one I can learn anything, mm -hmm. and number two. If, if I, it makes me even more uh, stronger in my belief systems that I'm coming to the table with, right? Right. So I read this article previously. People can yeah. read it, you know. But just in that opening line, line, I'll read out here. It's that time of year again for the annual Dirty Dozen and Clean Fifteen list from the Environmental Working Group. The EWG publishes these lists on their website every spring, and without any scrutiny or context, the list gets picked up by major media, right? And they go on to talk about the 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 Dirty Dozen and the Clean Fifteen and the phrase toxic pest. Per, uh, pesticides, which is in quotes, in quotes, in itself is a nonsense term. So basically, <laughs> this goes back to our larger argument. I won't read the whole article here. People can link, you know, they can read it. We'll put it inside of the show notes. But to steel man their side of the argument, <clears throat> they the ag industry says, look, we have an FDA, right? Mm -hmm. These things are constantly tested. They're scrutinized. They do animal studies. In some cases, there mm -hmm. might even be human studies. But it goes back to the larger thing that we're saying. Nobody's looking at the synergistic effect, mm -hmm. right? Nobody's looking at the long-term impact of these things. And right. they definitely are not on the cutting edge of clinical care mm -hmm. where a doctor like yourself is getting a chance to see that firsthand when a patient is reducing their toxic load, mm -hmm. how their condition can improve. And right. yes, we don't have these big studies because these mm -hmm. articles like this say, Where's the science? Where's that big study that shows that you can reverse autoimmune by going on the mm -hmm. clean 15 and staying right. away from the dirty, dirty dozen? Yep. We don't have that. And anybody's yep. waiting for that is yep. going to be waiting for a long time. And in the right. meantime, we're getting sicker, we're getting more unhealthy, mm -hmm. and we're in a place where this toxic overload in particular is ruining our lives. And it's not just autoimmune, mm -hmm. it's infertility, right? Right. It's obesogens mm -hmm. that are out there. It's PFAs that babies are being exposed to. Yep. These are so pervasive and this is a grand experiment mm -hmm. and you don't have to be 
a scientist to see the connections yeah. between all these areas. And this is why, you know, the agricultural industry is investing in things like this because people are actually voting with their dollars. Right. People are like, you know what? This doesn't make sense to me. I don't think I want this exposure and I'm willing to pay a little bit more money mm -hmm. to make sure I can avoid it in my life. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm rolling the dice, okay, what's the worst thing if it doesn't end up being 100% true? Yep. Right? It's yes. still probably somewhat true. So I yes. just wanted to bring yeah. it up because I feel like Great that's point. a lot of the argument that people see on TV yes. and online from different groups that are out right. there. And, and it deserves, you know, it, it's worth addressing. Absolutely. That's a great point. And if I could add a couple of things please, to that. Please, please, go on your own um, rant. I, I, I went on my own. <laughs> so one, uh, one is the topic of glyphosate. And then two is the the need for randomized control trials to be our evidence. So uh, first, with glyphosate, um, it is one of those things that's very controversial. So there's um, you know 15 billion tons of it used every year. It's super common. Um, and um, but like you said, you know they're not really studying the l low grade exposure. We know that glyphosate at high levels, like if you're an agricultural worker, um, that's why th they have a significantly higher risk of autoimmune disease because of that you know pesticide exposure. But um, they're not studying like the low levels that we're all exposed to now in, in the food from the soil. Um, and then also uh, glyphosate has a, a big impact on the microbiome. So it was uh, originally brought to market as an antibiotic. Um, glyphosate does uh, disrupt a number of like the gut bacteria. Um, and those effects are kind of ignored because it's like, well, that's just, that's just your bacteria, right? But now we know how important the microbiome is. And um, so those kind of things are, are not emphasized by the conventional view. Um, totally. Yeah. And I think there is scrutiny that's deserved in the wellness community too, because sometimes the claims are made so bold by people who yep. get very excited, especially a lot of patients right. mm -hmm. who get excited and they turn their life upside down, they get better. Yep. And now they become a huge advocate and they want everybody else to be perfect immediately. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, don't eat this thing, especially on social media, because those are the things yep. that go viral. Mm -hmm. Don't eat this thing. You're going to get autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think the industry yep. or more traditional clinicians are like, this is alarmist. Mm -hmm. And it feels like, you know, that's not the right approach either. Yes. Right. This yeah. is why we need a measured approach in the middle, which is like, right. We don't want to stress out about this stuff, but that doesn't mean we mm -hmm. can't take it seriously. Yes. And in a measured way, because big picture, autoimmune conditions are going up. Mm -hmm. It's getting worse. Now there's people with, you're starting to see a lot of, I'm talking to a lot of practitioners who are like, I'm dealing with people that have multiple autoimmune conditions right. yep. that they're struggling with. Mm -hmm. And we know what the root causes are. So let's do our best best to tackle them all individually without mm -hmm. being an alarmist. But at the same time too, it's not being an alarmist to say, hey guys, don't panic, but there is a fire in the building. Let's slowly and diligently make our way out to this mm -hmm. exit. Yep. Otherwise, we're all going to be set on fire. Right. right? That's not yeah. an alarmist to tell people that there's an actual literal yes. inflammatory fire that's going on in people's bodies with an autoimmune condition. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then I think the other thing that in the conventional view that's often like very emphasized is the need for randomized control trials. You know, in my medical training, medical school, residency, we were taught that, uh, you know, if something has not been proven in a randomized control trial, then it's not true. You know, it's not valid. Um, we, we need those RCTs. And I'm a big fan of RCTs. You know, we, we can do them for some. But what people don't realize is there's huge aspects of health that is just impossible. It cannot be done, you know. A randomized control trial. Let's take exercise, right? You, in order to do an RCT, you would have to randomize um, people to either like exercise a lot or exercise a little, and then follow them over 10, 20 years. You know, nobody's going to do that study. You can't do an RCT to look at the effects of sleep because you'd have to randomize some people to be sleep deprived, others to sleep, med you know, medium amount, others to sleep a lot, and then look at the differences, right? So you can't use RCTs there. Um, and I'm a big um, advocate of research. I'm actually try, um, start, uh, starting a research study right now to look at the Tiger Protocol diet for autoimmune conditions and uh, start to, because we do need that. You know, we do sure. need data. So it doesn't I'm, mean that you don't I'm, do any research. Yeah. So I'm all for that. I'm trying to get funding for this study right now. And then we're going to, you know, look at, hopefully look at autoimmune hepatitis, which is one of like a very difficult to treat autoimmune mm. condition, even with the conventional drugs. 
Um, so I'm a big fan of, of research, but you know, with a lot of these things, like the, the, there are still other types of evidence that are not RCTs. I think that's what we can't ignore. We have to know that you know it's not going to be possible to do an RCT for toxins and autoimmunity. You'd have to random randomize, you know, giving people toxins and others not, and then see. <laughs> you know, you can't do that. But we have to look at and then these also other control things. for the yeah. toxins that they're getting in their normal life, which is right. basically impossible. Right, right. So, but we have to still. Uh, that that doesn't mean you just throw up your hands and say, you know, we can't conclude any of this stuff is valid because we can triangulate from other sources of data. You know, we can look at um, case control studies where they compare people with an autoimmune disease to healthy people and look at what are those differences. Um, we can look at um, other like ret uh, retrospective uh, data in terms of like what kind of factors were in uh, pa patient population with autoimmunity. Um, we can even look at like their real world examples where people, for example, have been exposed to high levels of toxins living near like a Superfund site, like with environmental chemicals or toxic waste. Um, there was a, um, it's called the Buffalo Lupus Project in mm. Buffalo, New York. And this is part of another factor with just underserved communities often get- Buffalo uh, Lupus, can we look that yeah. up? Buffalo, Buffalo Lupus, Lupus Project. Lupus yeah. Project. So yeah, could you explain so, what that is? Yeah, so um, this is one of those real world examples where there was a community that had um, seven times the rate of lupus as uh, the community that in, in the neighboring town. Um, wow. And, uh, um, so then people started wondering what's going on and they found that there was a, a leaking uh, toxic waste site nearby, which was releasing like uh, four or five different um, toxins. And so that's like one of those, you know, real world examples where you had somebody, you know, multiple exposure to toxins. And then um, that's the community came together. They actually got the government to clean up the site and mm. they showed, you know, these rates of lupus. So, um, so that so we have to triangulate between all these different data points and and realize that you know there's truth here that there's no way we're going to be able to do RCTs but we can still get to the truth in other ways. Yeah, I'm reading this here so uh I'll just jump to the results section. The Buffalo Lupus Project identified an excessive number of people with lupus and other autoimmune diseases and just so everything's clear like lupus mm -hmm. is an autoimmune disease. Yeah. Uh, residing in an area plagued with multiple sources of toxic waste exposure. Yep. As shown by this project, engaging the community in research and involving the community members in action to improve their neighborhood can positively impact the environmental quality. The study also played a leadership role in advocating for site cleanup and continuing legislation to support lead screening. Yep. That's crazy. Yeah. Did you yeah. did you ever see this? It was in the news. Um, maybe we could Google this, Tessa. I know it's probably... Uh, um, behind a paywall, but at least we could see the title. New York Times, um, soldiers led uh, army and mm. functional medicine. Google oh, that. Yeah. Did you end up seeing I this? I actually see a number of um, retired military, uh -huh. many of whom have autoimmune conditions yeah. because of that toxic, you know, jet fuel, the, all the chemicals on battlefields, right. uh, all the toxic exposure, all the stress, uh, trauma, you know, all those factors. Yeah. So this is so, an article I've mentioned it yeah. before. Yes. This is in the New York times. And this was in 2019. The army thought he was faking his health issues. Turns out he had chronic lead poisoning. Yes. And this is a story of a, a gentleman we have yep. here, Stephen Hopkins, an army mm -hmm. veteran who received the diagnosis of chronic lead poisoning outside of his gym in Fort, in Fort Washington, Maryland. And ba basically the story of a, uh, if I remember correctly, because I read it mm -hmm. when it first came out, army veteran who through his service had this chronic lead exposure. Yep. And there was yep. a few other people, they were constantly looking for solutions but in the military, you know, one of the things that they're worried about is people basically making things up to right. get out of service, mm -hmm. right? Which which happens, right? Yep. I don't have anybody in the family that served. You know, I have friends that have served, so I've talked a little bit about them. Mm -hmm. And so there was a dismissal, there's a dismissal of sort of their symptoms because they couldn't find anything immediately, right? Because mm -hmm. they're sort of relying on that sort of medicine 1.0, medicine 2.0, and they're not even really looking for things like lead and whatever. And he didn't know what he had. Yep. Ultimately, they stumbled upon I believe it was the group at the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and met a couple of doctors there who actually were willing to kind of go on the journey with them right. and find out that actually some of the symptoms that they were dealing with, mm -hmm. and I don't remember the symptoms exactly, were related to chronic lead exposure. Mm -hmm. now, now, these are extreme situations, yep. right? 
serving in the military, mm -hmm. being in one of these burn pits, yep. which are a big problem, Yes. right? And people like John Stewart have been trying to get funding mm -hmm. to cover these burn pit, pit victims when we were burning our uh, you know, arsenal or trash or whatever yep. in Iraq or Afghanistan, mm -hmm. and that causing all sorts of toxic exposure to the military that were serving at that time. Um, so burn pits, this toxic waste dump town situation, mm -hmm. Flint, Michigan. Yes. But what people have to realize is that most individuals are not going through that right now, right. but you're going through a slow version of that because yeah. the combination and the synergistic effect, especially when it comes to toxins mm -hmm. and how they could be connected in with something like autoimmune conditions. Yes, exactly. Um, and uh, yeah, the, um, there's, uh, I do see a number of like retired servicemen and, you know, in my um, practice and uh, I'm always very grateful for their service. And then, you know, they struggle with the the healthcare system because the, um, the VA is always um, looking out for people who are trying to fake disability and, you know, trying to get benefits. Um, so I've had to kind of work with them to fight for, you know, the recognition of their conditions that resulted from previous like toxin exposure. Um, and then one other thing I'll, I'll mention is that um, another population that has been studied that had exposure to multiple toxins was cleanup workers after 9-11. Mm. So the workers involved, there right. were many workers who were involved in cleaning up after 9-11 were exposed to high levels of lead and other like environmental chemicals. And they had uh, an eightfold risk of developing autoimmune diseases uh, in the decade after that. They were followed. Um, and um, across the board, like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, multiple sclerosis. So again, you know, the same mechanism underlies all those. Well, a dear mutual friend of ours who's been on this podcast before, Dr. Terry Wall, is also yes. an autoimmune expert, talks right. about how she feels that one of the things that increased her risk of autoimmune was growing up on a farm. Right. And she used to spray yep. pesticides on mm -hmm. the farm and she used to be exposed to them and she would deal with all sorts of things that she didn't wear like a whole hazmat suit. Yeah. She right. just was a farm girl, you know, growing up on a farm, dealing with all that, spraying yep. pesticides, you know, dealing mm -hmm. with all the different chemicals that she was giving across. And that was playing a role in yep. sort of her diagnosis of this uh, uh, severe form of multiple sclerosis. Yes. Right? Yeah. And I, I think that's absolutely a big issue. And also another area where um, underserved populations are really feeling the brunt of this. So agricultural workers, uh, pesticide applicators, you know, lar uh, largely Hispanic and often Hispanic women who are in these roles with the pesticide exposures um, have very, been shown to have greatly increased risk of autoimmune diseases. Yeah, it can feel overwhelming at times when you look yes. at how pervasive it is, how much chemicals that are out there. But when you take a deep breath right. yes, and you take yes. a step back and you say, yeah. all right, okay, this is the reality. Yeah. Okay. So what do we want to do? How do we navigate it? How do mm -hmm. we go through the process to actually end up bringing ourselves back to health? Mm -hmm. Because the one thing that's in this face of this is that the human body is quite resilient, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Yes. And, and in fact, you know, in your book, The Tiger Protocol, you know, we have the link in the show notes, people can pick it up. It's a fantastic mm -hmm. read. You have a few, you know, testimonials of people mm -hmm. that have gone through the Tiger Protocol and have reclaimed their health a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, not to put you on the spot, but are there any that come to mind that amongst all this doom and gloom that we've just been yes. talking about a little bit, I thought it'd be nice before we tease out oh, yeah. gut health and how to eat right and rest and talk right. about infections. Mm -hmm. There's plenty more to cover. Oh yeah. Is there a testimonial that comes to mind that shows the resiliency and the power of mm -hmm. the human body to overcome, mm -hmm. you know, this toxic soup that we live in? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the first autoimmune patients I took care of comes to mind. Um, so she was a nurse at our local hospital. She was about uh, 44 at the time. And uh, um, she had like two young kids and, you know, a nurse working 12 hour shifts. So she was always tired and thought it was just the busy life and being a mom to two young kids. But then it started like interfering with her work. And so she went to her doctor um, who did some blood work and um, found that her um, she had Hashimoto's, she had po like positive thyroid antibodies, but her hormone levels were actually normal. Her thyroid hormone was normal. She did not did not qualify for a medication. Um, she's what we would call subclinical hypothyroidism. That's the term. 
Um, so the doctor um, told her, you know, there's nothing I can do for you now. Your um, thyroid is going to fail in a few years. And at that point, I can prescribe you a medication. So come back and we'll check it every, you know, couple of years. Just wait for it to fail. <laughs> and uh, that's, you know, essentially what she was told. But she came to our clinic seeking a more proactive approach. You know, she didn't want to just wait around for things to happen. Because uh, like you said earlier, autoimmune disease is a very long, slow process occurring over like, many years or even decades um, so when we met with her, I did some testing and um, found that she had pretty high levels of like lead and mercury. Um, and so we went through some targeted detox. Um, she had to have some fillings replaced. We um, worked on her diet as well. Um, and then she also had uh, dysbiosis. So her gut bacteria were really off. You know, she had what they called IBS, just kind of like non-specific GI symptoms, but didn't qualify for like a real disease. So nothing was done. Uh, but we healed her gut. Um, we worked on her um, immune system with herbs using Ayurvedic herbs. Um, and um, what we were able to do is actually bring her thyroid antibodies back down to normal. Um, and um, that doesn't happen with everyone. And, you know, she was a, a good uh, example. She was very proactive, but, um, but that was poss possible. And, and most importantly, she felt better. She lost weight. She got her energy back. Her brain fog resolved. Um, she kind of felt like herself again. She realized it's not just being a mom and a nurse that's making me feel terrible um, because I can feel good again. And I think um, that was one of the cases that really kind of um, stimulated me on this path forward of coming together with putting together a protocol for autoimmunity because I saw the what was lacking, you know, in her conventional care, and then how we were able to fill the those gaps with the more integrative medicine approach. So let's talk to, let's use her example yeah. as an opportunity to go a little bit further into the diet piece of things. Yes. Okay. So, you know, I'm sure it was a while ago, you said this is yeah. one of your first patients, but just right. the example of her as an archetype. So I'm sure there's other mm -hmm. patients that you've seen that are kind of similar to this. Yep. Um, there's going to be themes that are similar. What are you finding that people are not getting right when it comes to their diet and they're mm -hmm. coming in and not understanding how their standard American diet and the specific components of it are maybe increasing their likelihood of autoimmune condition mm -hmm. or making their autoimmune condition worse or not allowing them to heal, right? Yes. What are some of the pillars yep. of their diet that are really putting a lot of stress on their body? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so with diet, I like to separate it out. Um, so I have like a phase one diet, which is mm -hmm. more of an elimination diet, which is more restrictive, more uh, focused on gut healing. And then there's the phase two diet where you're kind of reintroducing foods, you're expanding the prebiotic foods, you're rebuilding the microbiome. And I feel like um, that's something that's missing, you know, because oftentimes I see patients, you know, they're on like a, the autoimmune paleo diet, which is a very common diet. Um, or the whole 30 and they you know felt significantly better and then I've been on it for 10 years you know but it was never intended for that because you don't want to be on a very restrictive diet long term you want to be on a restrictive diet for like a certain amount of time do some gut healing do some detox and then start expanding your diet so you can build up the diversity of your bacteria which is one of the key barometers of the microbiome and keys to longevity so um, so that's a mistake I often see in diet when I, I have patients come to me saying, yeah, I've been on this very restrictive diet. And then over time, it becomes very hard to follow because it's, it's so restrictive. And um, so I've, I think, so what I focused on like with her, for example, was uh, um, three kind of big things, which were um, cutting back on gluten, dairy, and sugar. In that first phase. In the first phase, right. yeah, exactly. And, and that yeah. first phase is designed to be restrictive on purpose. Yes. But it's not designed to be where you stay forever. Right. Which is an yep. important thing mm -hmm. to talk about, yep. right? Which is what you were just sharing. Yes. And first, as basic as that sounds, why is it designed to be restrictive, right? What are yeah. you trying to do? Mm -hmm. And what are you trying to minimize yep. when it comes to the body and autoimmune? Yeah. So the research shows that um, patients with autoimmune disease tend to have much higher levels of food sensitivities. Um, and that's like common ones that they've tested are like dairy products, um, gluten as well. 
Um, so we know that they are much more likely to have reactions to foods. And we have to distinguish between food allergy and food sensitivity. So a food allergy is like what pe pe people think of usually, like you react to shellfish or um, peanuts and you can't breathe or your lip swells up. That's an immediate reaction. That's a food allergy. But a food sensitivity is actually something quite different. Um, there may be no symptoms. There could be delayed symptoms, like up to two to three days after ingesting the food. There could be nonspecific symptoms like brain fog, fatigue, or malaise, headaches, um, congestion. Or there could just be inflammation triggered in the body without symptoms. So um, food sensitivities are what we think about. And that's the reason for eliminating uh, those foods, because those are some of the common sensitivities. And, um, you know, we can do tests. So like sometimes we test patients for food sensitivities, and then use that as a guide to what um, they need to eliminate. But statistically, yeah, gluten, dairy um, are the two biggest food sensitivities. And those are a problem because they um, really uh, inflame your immune system. So in the gut, when you are exposed to foods that you have antibodies against, which is what a food sensitivity is, then your immune system goes into hyperdrive. It's like constantly reacting to the foods you're eating every single day. And that just um, predisposes to autoimmunity and worsens autoimmunity. So that's the, the main reason for that. Yeah, when you have an autoimmune condition, your body's on high alert. Yep. And basically, like a police or the army would put out like an, I mean, the army doesn't do it, but the but like the local police might put out an APB, right? Right, right. Hey, look for anybody who's like this. Yes. And, you know, you and I are both brown and they say, look, you know, go for go after anybody who's brown. And right. even if we're not doing anything wrong, we're going to be get, getting caught up in the mix. And that's yes. what I've heard that yep. people talk about when it comes to gluten, dairy, these foods themselves are not inflammatory, mm -hmm. right? In fact, dairy has been shown to be yeah. anti-inflammatory, Yes, right? But people with autoimmune conditions can have more of a reaction to these foods because their body is already on higher alert. So yes. we need to bring it on low alert. One of the ways that you do that is you're restricting the diet for a temporary period of time yep. to make sure you're removing anything that might put the body on high alert mm -hmm. until you can kind of quiet the immune system down right. by getting to the root issues. Is that accurate? Yeah, exactly. And my goal is always um, trying to expand the diet as much as possible, as much as someone will tolerate. Um, so I think the um, the elimination phase is the, the phase one diet, but then the reintroductions are even more important. And that's part of the phase two. And there's a lot of subtlety and nuance in that, you know, which um, I work with my patients on. I, I talk about in the book, like what's the order to reintroduce foods? You should reintroduce the foods that are kind of least allergenic first. So, you know, if you've eliminated like nuts and seeds or nightshades, or, you know, maybe those are earlier in the reintroduction. And then you reintroduce more allergenic foods like dairy towards the end and then gluten at the very end because it's the most allergenic. So that maximizes the chance of success because the goal is always getting people to expand their diet to the maximum diversity they can tolerate um, and then making sure and then hoping we can heal their gut enough where they get to a point where they can tolerate some amount of gluten, some amount of dairy, um, <clears throat> fermented dairy, extremely beneficial like yogurt and kefir. Um, and, um, and have, you know, kind of like that 80, 20 rule. That's kind of our target. Yeah. And gut healing is really the key sort of thing. Yes. Uh, before we get into that, just a little bit more about that phase one. So what, yep. you know, we talked about some of the things that people aren't really eating and mm -hmm. you're removing a lot of things like, you know, gluten, dairy, sugar, yep. right. Just mm -hmm. for how pervasive sugar is yes. and metabolic health, other things, and that leading to a whole inflammatory cascade. But what do typically people find themselves eating during this time period, right? If you would look at their meal, like what are they eating mm -hmm. for breakfast? You know, what are they eating for dinner during yes. this period of time? <clears throat> yeah, so that's um, one way I, di I differ from the AIP diet is I- um, Autoimmune paleo. Yeah, autoimmune paleo, which- Diet. The AIP diet does not allow any grains at mm -hmm. all. Uh, mm -hmm. even the gluten-free grains like rice and quinoa mm -hmm. and you know so forth but um those are um allowed in in my elimination diet so people can have oatmeal they can have uh, you know rice cereal they can have um quinoa they can have as long as they options. do okay with these yeah, they can exactly. have them as long yeah exactly as long as they're not having a like overt reaction then yeah. those foods are i have found like very unlikely to, to cause issues some patients do react to all grains, but uh, the majority can tolerate those gluten-free grains. 
So that will open up a lot of options in terms of your diet. Um, and then um, having a good quality protein, whether it's, uh, um, you know, like uh, could be like grass fed beef or some healthy fish or poultry, I, I think that's uh, uh, excellent. Um, I also, in terms of legumes, I um, also allow mung beans in my, uh, in the diet for elimination because- Which are popular in like yeah. Ayurveda. Yeah, Can you exactly. explain what they are just for people who are not familiar with yeah. mung beans? Yeah, mung beans are a very small kind of a yellow bean that is used a lot in Ayurveda because it's super easy to digest. It's um, the smallest legume. And they're usually and, uh, sprouted, right? Like often sprouted. Often sprouted yeah, or yeah, pressure often. cooked. Yes, always pressure cooked. Um, and uh, um, yeah, so they're very easy to digest. They're an excellent source of protein. So for people who are vegetarian, um, there's an Ayurvedic dish called kichari, mm -hmm. which I have a recipe for, which is basically rice and mung beans and some spices. And... Uh, um, so that's a, a very healthy, you know, that's a very healthy meal. Like uh, in Ayurveda, there's some um, programs where you all you eat is kitchari for like two weeks. Yeah, people I've feel great. Those. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, um, so, yeah. So, and then, you know, the foundation of the diet, of course, is fruits and vegetables. So yeah. we, we all should be eating more, you know, fruits and vegetables, but um, having plenty of those healing foods, you know, the right blend of fruits and vegetables, adding in the prebiotic vegetables. So you can add that like up front to the foods that um, start to start, uh, strengthen the microbiome. So adding in the, the prebiotic vegetables, incorporating fruits. Um, and I'm a really big fan of broccoli sprouts. So mm -hmm. because of their sulforaphane. Right. So that's a compound that over 2000 studies have been done looking at sulforaphane and it uh, clearly lowers inflammation and also um, supports the immune system. And um, it's very good for the brain as well. Um, so I think um, incorporating yeah, broccoli sprouts throughout all phases of the, the diet is what I recommend. Yeah, and I think it's important to talk about what you can eat because when you think of it that way, People, people get very nervous, especially if they've been eating a more processed food diet, right? right? Even if it's a processed wellness diet, right? Mm -hmm. They've been eating a lot of avocado toast or whatever. And, you yep. know, um, uh, like, you know, they've been eating a lot of like bread or pasta, or they've been eating a lot of packaged food that's there. And then they yep. look at an elimination diet, right? And, and by the way, this is for people who have a diagnosed autoimmune yep. condition. Can you do it if you do not have a diagnosed autoimmune condition? Like, is this you a can. program that you can do even if you don't have a diagnosis yet? Yes, because with autoimmune disease, there are many people that um, are kind of in a gray area where they don't meet the criteria for a disease. Would that be called but, subclinical or sort of pre-autoimmune or something like that? Um, yeah, a subclinical, you know, autoimmune. So they're having some symptoms. Yeah, yeah exactly. What are the common so, ones that are out there? Because I mean, there's yeah. so many autoimmune conditions, yes. right? Like yeah. 80, 100 plus different mm -hmm. ones out there. Right. What are the common things that people might think of? Yeah. Obviously, they have to work with their doctor and figure yes. out, but sometimes the doctors actually don't know. Right. So that disclaimer right. doesn't is not always the most helpful. Yes. But what would be an example of either blood test mm -hmm. or symptoms that somebody's dealing with that indicate that they might be in that subclinical pre-autoimmune phase mm -hmm. yep. where their immune system is starting to get very reactive? Right. Um, so I think that, um, you know, uh, in terms of blood work, the, these autoantibodies, mm -hmm. which are the um, autoimmune kind of markers made by the immune system, um, often uh, can predate the development of the autoimmune disease by like 10, 20 years. And so uh, if you're getting blood work, screening for some of those autoantibodies can be a clue because uh, that could be one of the signs that you might benefit from this program, you know. Um, but some of the common symptoms I see, fatigue, you know, of course, is super common, but that can be caused by this. Um, joint pains, like uh, different kinds of aches and pains. And then um, cognitive issues like brain fog or, you know, mood issues. Those are probably like the three most common symptoms I see. But if you have the resources, because it takes a little bit of like, you got to convince your doctor to run right. this, you know, yes. panel. Yep. Or, I mean, do you know any services that sort of in, it kind of are more consumer friendly that people can use to that then include this screening, these auto um, Well, um, you know, Cyrex Labs. Cyrex uh, Labs. What but it's use. tough. You yeah, got to have a practitioner. Yeah. I don't think there's a direct to consumer. I think there's a great opportunity for that, but I don't think it's been done yet. I think there's um, a yep. company that Mark Hyman uh, just got involved with called Function Health. Okay. But I'll double check. And if it does, we'll put inside of the, the show notes. Mm -hmm. I think they might have an auto uh, 
um, some of the autoimmune markers yeah, included in their exactly. normal sort of uh, uh, panel. So, right. okay. So the question was, can you do this if you don't have an auto, auto yes. diagnosed disease? And you should still feel that there is some reason that you're going on the tiger protocol right? because it's directly tied into autoimmune Yes. because then you wouldn't necessarily need to be doing the elimination phase one, mm -hmm. right? You can just eat healthy yeah. and you can include a lot of the great principles that are inside of here, but it right. doesn't mean that you have to necessarily be super strict because that's more useful for somebody that's either on their way towards an autoimmune condition or mm -hmm. has an autoimmune condition. Yes, exactly. So yeah, and anyone, um, you know, even in that early autoimmune subclinical phase could benefit from it. And uh, anyone who wants to reduce inflammation, uh, I think would benefit from this approach, because it's uh, highly anti inflammatory, you know, from the diet perspective, from the spices we're incorporating from uh, just detoxing that lowers your inflammation from some of the supplements I'm recommending. And we know inflammation is kind of the root cause for all our modern chronic diseases, right? So we we know like for almost all of us working to bring our inflammation down and keep it low is uh, is really vital for long-term health. Before we get into supplements and a few yeah. other things that are there, right? I, I want to go to the phase two part of the diet, right? Yeah. So phase one, it's better to look at sort of all the things that you can eat. Mm -hmm. And especially if you are strength training and things like that, you're prioritizing protein and getting good quantity of protein, mm -hmm. which I feel has been a big topic over the last wow. couple of years. You know, yes. we've had people like Dr. Gabrielle Lyon on the podcast, right. uh, Dr. Donald uh, Lehman on the podcast last week, mm -hmm. one of the top protein researchers at University of uh, uh, Illinois out in Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of more people talking about why protein is important, mm -hmm. you know, doing our best to go for the clean sources if we, if we get a chance to and staying away from ultra processed foods and not processed meats that are there. Mm -hmm. um, so you're building your plate, plate around healthy proteins, and you can still do this if you're vegetarian. You can do mung beans, you know, other versions of that. You have mm -hmm. examples of that in your book. Fruits and vegetables, right? And then in your instance, which makes it a lot easier for people to follow, yeah. you still can have some grains and things like that yeah. as long as you're not super reactionary. Right. Weirdly, I have a, I don't have an autoimmune condition, knock on wood, mm -hmm. but I have a really bad reaction. I, I don't do well with things like quinoa. Oh, interesting. But I do well with white rice. Okay. You know, okay. I don't know works. why, yeah. but hey, whatever works. Yes. yes. So now if you look at that, there's a whole plethora of things that you can eat. It mm -hmm. may take a little bit more work to sort of do some planning on the weekends, yep. but you're going to find that there's a ton of stuff that you can eat. You don't have to be nervous. You can't have pasta and other stuff like mm -hmm. that in the immediate term, yep. or maybe some of the processed foods that you're used to. So now the phase two what are some of the things that you're really focused on bringing in? Mm -hmm. Oh, actually, you know what? Sorry, yep. I wrote down a question that I wanted to get into first. Sure. In between the phase one and phase two is some gut healing. Yes. What have you found to be? Because in the tiger protocol, mm -hmm. T is for toxins, I is for infections, G is gut health. What have you found to be central when it comes to the intersection of diet and or supplementation mm -hmm. to start to repair the gut so that it's ready to include and expand the diet and the immune system, mm -hmm. which 80% of it, they always say is concentrated in the gut, mm -hmm. is not so reactive so that you can yes. actually take on these foods. So so take take your approach to gut health. Yep. What are some of the top action items and things that you're bringing in with some of your patients? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the that's very important because during that uh, phase one of elimination, you want to really add in these things so that you get the most benefit from that uh, phase one diet. So I am a big fan of bone broth. I think that um, even though it's a you know a bit of a fad, there is research on the all the the benefits for gut healing, you know, from the gelatin, the glycine, the amino acids. Um, so and, and apparently, that, it's maybe a twenty thousand year old fad. Like right. We, exactly. I think we've been probably making right. some version of stewed bone broth yes. for a long time. Right. Yeah. And we just eat the whole animal. Yes. <laughs> it's actually a medicine in Ayurveda. Uh, so for like thousands of years, it's been used. Wow, in, I didn't know that. In Ayurveda. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, so uh, if people do not want to eat, uh, have bone broth, then doing collagen powder is a good substitute. You can find like grass fed collagen powder, and that's uh, pretty easy to mix into like smoothies or water. So if that's an alternative. Um, so either bone broth or collagen powder. And then second, um, I really like glutamine. Uh, for its gut healing effects. And the, the best food source is actually the cabbage juice. 
So mm. if you just um, you have a juicer and can juice some cabbage, um, or you can make it in a blender. Um, cabbage is the, one of the richest food sources of glutamine. So if you're willing to drink that, that's an option. Or if not, you can find it easily as a supplement. It's a it's a white powder, easy to use. I think it's honestly easier to find as a supplement yeah, because true. then for a lot of people, you got to get a juicer, right, which is right. expensive in yes, itself. Yes, right? yeah. Yes. But uh, cabbage juice, interesting. Yeah. yeah, I always give people the option for food because there are some totally. that just only want to do foods. And I, I love working with food as medicine because it's so totally. powerful. But um, yeah, glutamine has good research to show like it heals uh, intestinal permeability, helps with the leaky gut, um, it helps with the dysbiosis, the imbalance of bacteria. Um, and it's usually like very well tolerated. So um, I think that's another integral part of the gut healing. Great. Anything else that's part of the gut healing protocol or things that you talk about inside of your book? Yeah. I mean, um, there are two other categories of foods um, that I think are very important. So um, one is prebiotic foods. So a prebiotic is basically um, something that has food for your gut bacteria. That's different from a probiotic, which is like the actual gut bacteria. So um so prebiotic foods, I think, should be introduced really um, upfront in the uh, phase one diet, even mm -hmm. because uh, um, there are certain prebiotic foods that don't um, um, that most people can tolerate that uh, you know don't really cause issues, and and those are the polyphenol rich foods. So um, so I think prebiotic foods are are really uh, key, and uh, um, that's an even bigger part of the phase two diet because. Um, Prebiotic foods are how you build a diversity of the microbiome. So then I go through some of the main categories like polyphenols and what are the best, uh, you know, fruits and vegetables. What are the the best like nuts and seeds? Um, so th th there's a lot of literature about the polyphenol content of, of foods. So just to take a step back with prebiotic foods, like for example, the legumes and beans are a really good source. Um, pe people with certain conditions like SIBO small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, they may not do well on prebiotic foods up front. So they typically do uh, well on polyphenols, which are the, the food that's tolerated. Um, but then I, I, um, I really recommend uh, um, getting resistant starch. So there's like three types of resistant starch. We can talk about those foods later. Um, and then I um, emphasize inulin, so inulin-rich foods. There's about a dozen inulin-rich foods that are really excellent. Inulin is one of those prebiotics that has a, a really good research for not just gut health, but helping your blood sugar, helping brain health, helping inflammation. Um, so getting inulin-rich foods. And then there are um, other categories like mushrooms are actually very powerful for healing the gut, powerful prebiotics. Um, so yeah, prebiotic foods is a really huge topic. But then the second big category is fermented foods. So studies show that fermented foods also reduce inflammation and improve immune markers. So they do improve some of these like um, cytokines, which are the immune system like messengers. Um, so incorporating both of those is, is very good for gut healing. And one thing I've noticed just with friends of mine who've gone on, you know, different protocols where they're including in prebiotics is that sometimes you start a little slow yes, and you work your way up yep. because depending on how damaged your gut is, you could have a reaction to it, right? So you're yes. just building up, starting slow and ideally maybe not mixing so many at the same time. If right, you're trying absolutely. inulin, you're just trying that for a little bit and getting yep. to a level where you feel comfortable mm -hmm. and you're kind of maintaining it and you've got it as a part of your diet. And then you can maybe, if you wanted to try something else, then you could try something else. But sometimes people right. see that, wow, this is good, that's good, this is good. Let me put it all in yes, some big smoothie yes. and blend it. Right. And you end up having like a big gut bomb and you're right. like thrown off for you know a week yeah. yes, with yes. your gut trying to recover. Yeah, I think that's an important principle, which is um, start low and go slow with the, the, the dosage. Because um, even um, low dosages of prebiotic foods and fermented foods uh, have benefit. So um, I, I've had patients like when they're trying to introduce fermented foods like sauerkraut, they could only start with the sauerkraut juice. They could not have the actual vegetable. Can they mix it with yeah. the cabbage juice? Yes. <laughs> yeah, they, they could. Yes. Uh, so then they start with like a, a teaspoon of sauerkraut juice per day. And if it feels like laughably small, but I say, no, that's good. You're getting your, your gut used to this change. And then you work up to a tablespoon. Then you start adding a little bit of the actual sauerkraut, the cabbage. And... Uh, 
So that way, over many like uh, you know days or weeks, you're building up slowly, and that's a much better strategy to get your gut to tolerate the, these foods. Do you find that the average person who's dealing with sort of an autoimmune condition, mm-hmm. which hopefully they have some level of medical care that they have access to, mm-hmm. and of course, you know, most people getting access to precision medicine doctor, functional medicine integrative, there's going to be a cost because insurance doesn't, you know, doesn't pitch in or anything else like that. Mm-hmm. I, um, although in our case, we take insurance. Oh, that's right. So that's you do, of, you do. Yeah, one yeah. of the few clinics. Because you guys are part of a larger group. Yeah, we're right? part of a group called Sutter Health, which Sutter is Health. throughout California. And um, we're trying to be the integrative medicine uh, branch within Sutter Health. Do you guys have like a massive waiting list? We do, yeah, <laughs> for that reason, yeah. For that reason. We have, um, you know, five clinics in the Bay Area, but um, yeah, massive waiting lists. But, you know, that's why I'm, I'm looking at more innovative models. Like I'm doing a lot of group visits these right. days. And then I've um, also created some online courses like on autoimmune right. disease and so forth. So great, this question goes right into it. So of course people yeah. can sign up for the waiting list and, you know, knock on wood, I hope they, you know, can get seen by you or other yeah. people that you guys might refer or recommend. Mm-hmm. But for the average patient that's out there who maybe doesn't have access, yep. do you find that they can go through the process of this protocol and the dietary mm-hmm. things on their and, and even the gut health? Yep. Can can is it doable to do it on your own mm-hmm. and in a way that allows for a lot of the sort of trial and error that even a functional yes. medicine doctor is doing, mm-hmm. right? Because it's not like you have the yeah. exact, there's no one test you can do to see right. what foods work well for a patient Correct. or not. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you have to tell them to try something. Mm-hmm. They try it and then they have a really bad reaction. Yep. And they're like, I don't do well with this food or supplement. And I mm-hmm. know in general, it works for a lot of people. It doesn't work for me. Mm-hmm. Is this tiger protocol doable enough for people that they can navigate through the ins and outs of trial and error as long as they're willing to do their their homework in the process. Yes, absolutely. And that was my goal for writing the book was to try to keep it simple, try to keep it practical and not overwhelm people and include steps that, um, because I think the average person may not have access to a practitioner to guide them. So I wanted to really put enough information in here that um, would allow a person to do this on their own. Um, there's a lot of guidance about um, the reintroductions, uh, like how you expand your diet after the initial elimination diet. That is trial and error. So every person has to do that on their own. But I walk people through how to do that. Um, and I think um, incorporating a lot of these uh, practices like you know the exercise or the sauna or meditation, you know, those are um, with some support, like with apps or coaches or trainers, you know, you can reach out to whoever you have. But uh, I, my goal was to make it um, accessible and possible to do on, on one's own. Now, I want to go on a little bit of a tangent, mm-hmm. right? Because you're talking about sort of the modern and you know you re- really synthesized it well in your book. This is like all the latest that we know about all the different best practices. Yep. But with the simplicity of like what really deserves focusing on. Like yes. you mentioned, early on in the autoimmune pre- paleo protocol, mm-hmm. diet rather, autoimmune uh, paleo diet, yep. which a lot of people have gone on and, and yep. gotten benefits on. Right. But as you mentioned, one of the challenges is because it's so stringent, mm-hmm. there's a lot of drop off yep. that's there. Yes. People can have things like grains, et cetera, which mm-hmm. are very important. We've had a lot of people talk yep. about how mm-hmm. women in particular, especially at different times of their cycle, mm-hmm. they actually might crave yes. more carbohydrates and they shouldn't necessarily be on the same protocol right. that would be recommended to other people. And there's a lot of nuances that are inside of that. Yep. And especially if you have 80% of women, you know, mm-hmm. 80% of autoimmune conditions as being 70, 80% as women, you got to find out what's going to be something that's actually going to be doable, yes. right? So including yep. things like grains. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's put inside of this book. Mm-hmm. Now, and it's also, you're really taking us out of the second phase, which is making sure that people can then get back some level of normalcy in their life. Yes. So they don't have to be so worried. Right. Some of my friends that are the most stressed out are the ones that are so fearful of eating the wrong thing. Yes. Because genuinely, mm-hmm. they maybe haven't repaired their gut. Yep. And they're at a place where they're like, I can't eat that thing because it'll set me off and it'll, be, it'll mess me up forever. Mm-hmm. Right? So you're trying to give people some sense of your gut should be right? Mm-hmm. Up at a place ultimately that you can eat more stuff that's there. Right? right. Now there's this other side of the table that I'm sure you've seen because you follow all the different trends that are out there, mm-hmm. which is especially the carnivore group. Right. Right. That has their own approach to autoimmune mm-hmm. and their approach to autoimmune, just to synthesize for our audience, is that not 
only they would agree with a lot of the core root yep. issues that yes. you're talking about stress mm -hmm. toxins infections you know gut and then eating right they agree mm -hmm. with those same things and rest mm -hmm. <clears throat> their approach however would be that some of these plant compounds yep. are so damaging as mm -hmm. plant defenses that we just need to be off of them forever now, mm. you know, there's a, some prominent voices that are in that space, you know, Jordan Peterson and his daughter, Michaela yep. Peterson, other individuals that have autoimmune conditions mm -hmm. that are not just doing carnivore because they have an idealistic right. vision yeah. and they feel better on it, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then when they go off of it, they feel worse off of it, right? Yeah. What do you think mm -hmm. is going on in those cases, in those situations? And do you have patients yourself that have just decided mm -hmm. like, it's too tricky to try to figure out what to bring in and bring out. I'm just going to yes. decide to eat this super restrictive way, right. which is I'm only eating, you know, in the case of like somebody like Jordan Peterson, I mm -hmm. think he only eats beef, salt, and water, which oh, is like wow. kind of yeah. crazy. Right, right, right. No, that is. <laughs> but hey, yes. he's saying it works for him. Yes. So what are your thoughts yeah. about the whole mm -hmm. carnivore approach when it comes to autoimmune condition? Yeah, I think it's an elimination diet, you know, in an extreme way. Um, and all elimination diets have value. You know, that's the, the goal in terms of like uh, um, figuring out what um, can improve your symptoms, you know. And there is a subset of people that, um, you know, really respond well to the carnivore diet. I have a number of patients who are following this diet. Um, and uh, um, I think that um, the, the idea uh, is that with any elimination diet, I believe it should be more short term. And then my goal is always trying to like increase the diversity of, categories of foods you're eating so not uh, not just yeah. for diversity's sake but, but yes. because and this yeah. is really the design is a yes. question right you feel that that diversity of food is actually translates into resiliency in our immune system yes. and resiliency in our body is that accurate yeah exactly and um and through you know building up the resiliency and diversity of the microbiome because that's what i think drives the other factors ultimately um and so i think what's going on is with the uh, people that really feel benefit from carnivore diet, two things. One is have a lot of food sensitivities um, and too many plant foods. And second is uh, I think there's a high degree of dysbiosis, which is that imbalanced environment, that unhealthy environment that can't tolerate any plant foods. And um, if you do the carnivore diet, it's it's going to not affect the dysbiosis, right? You won't be symptomatic from it. You won't be um, caught getting like, you know, a GI upset, but you're not solving the dysbiosis, right. which is uh, ultimately, I think, a long-term goal. And um, that can be done with like, you know, supplements or herbs or spices. But I think um, going upstream to like, you know, to think about why is the person only able to eat beef and water, you know, like uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's those two factors, food sensitivities and, and salt. dysbiosis. <laughs> <laughs> and salt. Yeah, sorry. But yes, so I think of it more as an elimination diet, there's a place for it. I have many patients on it. But um, with all elimination diets, I'm trying to keep them short term and long term, I'm always trying to expand the diversity. So of you're the open minded you understand yeah. that some people actually might be yes. in the situation where yeah. the extreme elimination diet if right. they eat yes. you know animal protein mm -hmm. might be a carnivore diet yes right For and even people. within you know cuz even now like some people say a carnivore diet is really a you know uh uh, I forgot carnivore MD Paul mm -hmm. Saladino. Yeah. you know he includes fruits inside of right. that as well right and, so, and honey and honey <laughs> right so he includes fruits he includes honey right um so there's different versions of it yeah. that are out there yes um and you know, some people feel like, okay, this is how human beings used to eat. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like, you know, a lot of people feel like human beings kind of ate whatever they could. Right. Because yeah. it was just about survival. Yes. And especially during the ice age or, you know, mm -hmm. periods of time or migration, it's kind of like you had to be good at mm -hmm. eating whatever you can get right. your hands on. Yes. Right? Yes. Absolutely. Um, and so you are open-minded enough to say that there are some people that they mm -hmm. might be in that situation where the carnivore diet is the answer for them. Yep. But based on everything that you've gone through in your research and your clinical practice, which is just as important, mm -hmm. right? That's part of evidence-based medicine is clinical yes. experience. We often think right. it's just randomized controlled trials. It's not, it's clinical experience. Right. That's right. a big part of it. So in your clinical experience, seeing that the generally, if we can increase that tolerance by increasing the diversity, addressing the gut dysbiosis, which is what mm -hmm. you talk about in your book. Now we can eat more variety that's there and we're going to get the benefits that come along with that, which part of that is also social too. 
Yes. Right? If you can break bread mm -hmm. with your fellow neighbor and it's not just over food that you have to make at home cooked in the exact oil that, you know, you can only have, otherwise you're going to get triggered. Mm -hmm you're going to miss out on a big chunk of what's out there and it's probably going to cause a lot of stress. Now, some people, that stress is worthwhile because they're so reactive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then the question is, how can they potentially, again, heal the gut so they can expand a little bit more? Yes, no, absolutely. Um, and I, I think, you know, going back to how humans evolved to eat, um, I think that is a common misconception that um, animal protein was like the majority of the diet because uh, this was part of my first book, The Paleo-Vedic Diet, where I really looked at our paleo ancestors. Yeah, explain ancestors. that concept for yeah. people, right? So yeah. paleo-Vedic, right? Yeah, so what that is is basically combining a um, plant-based paleo diet with Ayurvedic medicine, which is a traditional medicine from India. So using a lot of spices, using a lot of uh, legumes, using certain herbs. But in terms of the paleo component, they've actually studied you know, hunter-gatherer populations uh, around the world. And when they could get meat or fish, they would and they would eat it. Uh, but, you know, it's hard to catch an animal or, you know, it's hard to fish. You, you don't um, get get it like every single time, every single meal even. And um, so they did find that um, the majority of paleo ancestors uh, diet was plant foods. And those were things like um, tubers and leaves and berries and roots and things that, you know, you could gather um, but that is um, also like currently the Hadza, uh, which is one of these populations in Africa that are still living a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. Modern hunter-gatherer Modern, lifestyle. Modern, yeah. <clears throat> Their diet has um, over 100 grams of fiber every day because they eat these very starchy, uh, fibrous-like roots. Um, and so their microbiome is, is very healthy. And, you know, they've, they kind of are held as the pinnacle of like the microbiome, you know, how, um, and interestingly, th there was a study looking, showing that in Italy, people who followed um, kind of a modified paleo diet got the same gut diversity as the Hadza. So it doesn't mean you have to go to that extreme, right? Um, but yeah, with the, um, with the Hadza, there, um, there are just so many fibers, so much plant foods. And that is how, really we evolved with that. Yeah, I've fiber. seen, you know, yeah. it's, this is the part that obviously we don't know what happened yes. for sure back right. in the day, right? Right. We're doing our best to guess. And I think the research that you're referring to is the gentleman from Stanford? Uh, Lauren uh, Cordain's. Okay, research. Lauren Cordain's. Yeah. Okay, I think there's yeah. also a gentleman, Justin- Oh, Justin Sonnenberg. Sonnenberg, yeah, yeah, yes. who's done a little bit of work in this area too. Yes, yeah, he's a and microbiome he, researcher. Yep, and he was the one that was talking about the 125 grams of fiber. Yes, yeah. I've seen some of the criticisms in the carnivore community yep. that are, you know, some of the papers that are of other, you know, other individuals also sure. looking at the Hudsa, yep. specifically calling tubers and other plant foods as fallback foods. Mm -hmm. So I've seen, I've, you know, I've watched some of that. You know, at the end of the day, generally the people that I look up to and also the fact that I like, I actually like vegetables, Yes, right? right, right. I like vegetables. Yep. And I think that if you're working out, if you're getting good sleep, mm -hmm. you're prioritizing, you know, stress management tools and you have some driving purpose in your life, mm -hmm. right? Is, you know, then the rest, and as long as you're not eating ultra processed foods, yep. you know, you're generally going to be really good, right? You're going to be right. well off if you're doing that. Most people aren't even doing that Right. Alone, exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I like plant foods, and I like to eat plant mm -hmm. foods and and components. Yes. The the part that I think that gets a little bit so so I've seen the debates on both sides, yep. right? I've seen the debates on both sides, and and mm -hmm. I understand the institutions, um, and you know the place that they're coming from, and 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 I think that's still maybe there's a lot more that we don't know, mm -hmm. um, but generally speaking, I think that you should be able to tolerate, yeah, you know a divide, you know some diversity in, in a diet. But I think mm -hmm. there's this other movement that's happening inside of the functional medicine world too. I'd love to get your take, which is that, mm -hmm. you know, yes, we want diversity. We want to be able to eat different things. Mm -hmm. But even in you know, these modern hunter-gatherer tribes that are out there, it's not like they're going there out of their way to include extra diversity. Mm -hmm. The diversity right, right. is a byproduct of just eating with the seasons. Yeah. Yes. And there's plenty of foods that they're not getting access to because it's not in, those foods don't grow in their region. Right, right. I have true. seen some individuals take the extreme version of eat the rainbow mm -hmm. and they're wanting to get all the different, you know, the different things in their diet every single day instead of like, hey, he's, these are well-tolerated fibers that you do well with. Yes. Right? 
And if you don't do well with Jerusalem artichoke, or right. I don't do well with a lot of mushrooms. Mm -hmm, I do well sure. with a little bit of mushrooms. I eat a lot yeah. of mushrooms, I get freaking bloated. Yep. And I think it's okay to say, hey, I don't have to go and try to force the diversity right. that's right. there if I'm hitting some of the basics that are that are in my diet. Any thoughts yes, on that? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, no, I think it's true that, um, you know, the um, what we see for sure is that these um, hunter-gatherer populations and ancestral populations had high diversity in their microbiome, but they didn't always have high diversity in the type of plant foods. And the reason they can get away with that is because of the levels of certain prebiotics. If you have enough of them in the diet, even if it's from the same plant, that's enough to feed like a huge host of uh, bacteria. So, um, so in my research, uh, archaeologists I, I found had um, looked at these populations that lived in North America about 10,000 years ago. There's like a lot of sites where they're studying their remains. And they found that um, they had these, their diet, they were able to kind of extrapolate, had probably around 200 grams of fiber per day, but 125 grams of that was inulin. And that was from desert plants. So mm. like things like yucca and uh, various things that they would, they had these like rock ovens that they would uh, make the, you know, bake the plants in, the desert plants. And uh, so it gave them this really high amount of inulin. And, uh, you know, if you get like a high, high amount of prebiotic, whatever you tolerate, like you're saying, that in itself has value in terms of building the diversity of the microbiome, which is kind of the end result that we want. But it, it definitely should should be um, it should be known that you know our microbiomes evolved expecting a lot more fiber and right. that is and I most think, I think I think I've yeah. read the stats the average American is having less than 15 grams 15 of fiber. grams yeah exactly which right. is like you know one tenth of what we and we wonder with. why everybody's yeah. constipated all the time right, right right exactly and you have to be very gradual with increasing that but even going from 15 to 30 grams studies show like that will improve your um, stool pH, which is one of the like great metrics for the microbiome. Uh, mm -hmm. It will improve your diversity. So whatever steps you can take is, is going to be helpful. And not to mention these hunter-gatherer ancestors, you know, they, they, um, they're getting natural contamination from the soil right. and the water that they're drinking, yes. right? Yeah. They're spending time Good outside bacteria. and they're not around all this antibacterial right. soap and everything yes. like that. So that's yeah. getting them some natural contamination. Sure. What do you feel in both the Tiger Protocol as well as the Paleo-Vedic approach, mm -hmm. right? What do you feel that we here living in the Western world and now increasingly India is becoming more yeah. Westernized? Yes. What are some of the top things that we can benefit from? Whether it's autoimmune or whether it's mm -hmm. just the larger context of trying to be healthy, mm -hmm. what can we benefit from when it comes to the world of Ayurveda, which is yeah. this ancient medicine from India, mm -hmm. which, which was a huge part of your background and led to a lot of different home remedies and things that yes. you know you kind of grew up with. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the top things we can learn from Ayurveda mm -hmm. when it comes to our modern lifestyle? Oh yeah. Well, there's a lot because Ayurveda is a you know three thousand year old system of medicine, a vast, uh, all encompassing. Um, but I'll pick just a couple of things to highlight. So um, first is they believe that spices are a form of medicine, and I think food is medicine. Food is medicine, and especially spices because they're the um, most concentrated source of uh, antioxidants, uh, second to organ meats. So um, very nutrient dense, very rich in antioxidants. Um, very anti-inflammatory and very good for the digestion and the microbiome. They're prebiotic. So all of those things benefit inflammation, benefit autoimmunity. Um, and uh, um, they're also very good antimicrobials. So they help to get rid of those bad bacteria, get rid of yeast, get rid of parasites. Which was a super so, important in a tropical environment yeah. like a country yes. like India. Right. Right. Exactly. We yeah. had a lot of different parasites and other things. Bacteria was a big issue. Right. But, you know, even here, I, I see dysbiosis in like all my patients, you know, they, they, you still have those bad bacteria because of the food supply and, you know, stress and all these other factors. So, um, yeah, so spices like, um, you know, of course, turmeric, everybody knows about like the anti-inflammatory effect, but it's a very uh, potent antimicrobial. So it's really good, like antiviral, it has antibacterial effect. So I'm a big fan of um, using turmeric and uh, um, adjuane. So is a lesser known spice, but uh, adjuane is something that uh, has good research. It contains thymol, which is like the active ingredient that is a very good anti-fungal, uh, gets rid of candida, gets rid of like bad bacteria, um, and it, it soothes the GI tract, heals ulcers. So just from a spice, you know, you can get a lot of um, benefit. 
And then um, black cumin is another one that is uh, not as well known. So it's um, also known as nigella sativa or um, black caraway. It kind of looks like cumin, but it's completely different. And black cumin actually, and the black cumin oil uh, made from those seeds has been shown to be um, very anti-inflammatory in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. It relieved their joint pains uh, compared to placebo. Um, incorporating in the diet has anti-cancer properties, um, <clears throat> anti-inflammatory, and um, very high in antioxidants as well. So I think for people who are willing to kind of explore and add spices they're not familiar with, the benefits are um, are really huge. Yeah, that's great. And and is there a, a resource? Would you suggest your first book, or do you feel like in the Tiger Protocol you also have a little bit of guidance around spices and how to begin to start incorporating them in your diet? Oh yeah, no, I have a lot on spices in this protocol okay, because great. yeah, they're, they're actually an integral part of how I tackle infections. Mm. So the I part of the protocol is uh, adding in some of these um, really powerful spices like the black cumin and the ajwain and also um, cinnamon and um, ginger and turmeric for the antimicrobial effect. So that's a big part of this protocol because I think uh, spices are really underutilized. And do you also subscribe to the idea that spices have this hormetic response in so inside of the body? Like they like this positive stress Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we know that's in general how um, antioxidants uh, work. Is that uh, most dietary antioxidants they actually cause a little bit of oxidative stress, so they they do cause some of that in the body, and then the body responds by increasing production of its own antioxidants like glutathione and superoxide dismutase and you know all these things your body has all these pathways that are it's a hormetic response to the like little stress uh, from those um, antioxidants and spices are, are no exception so we can't go through it all and maybe we'll do a future podcast on ayurveda but is there yep. any other one or two other areas spices is a big category yeah. that's incorporated mm -hmm. anything else incorporated into this protocol that people can benefit from when it comes to the world of Ayurvedic? Yeah, I think, um, you know, there there is a real emphasis on being in tune with nature. So I think that is really, uh, is really critical because uh, I'm a big advocate of like outdoor time because we know now with modern research that sunlight um, directly stimulates some of your immune cells. Your immune cells move faster in the sunlight exposure. Sunlight um, raises, of course, your melatonin, helps your circadian rhythm, um, helps your sleep. It also raises your serotonin. So there's some newer papers looking at um, serotonin, which is made in the brain and also the gut, but it's also made in the skin. And uh, that is the neurotransmitter, which is like the, the feel-good messenger. You know, low serotonin can contribute to depression or insomnia. This is why people, there's seasonal affective disorder, where in the winter you don't get enough sun, there's a very high rate of depression. Um, and it's because sunlight is actually helping you make tryptophan and make the serotonin from that in uh, through your skin. So the more we learn about the benefits of sunlight and just being outdoors, uh, final thing on sunlight is um, for kids, it's been shown to be critical for their development. Uh, vision for their development of their eyes, the growth of their eyes. If they don't get enough sunlight, at least like an hour outside every day, um, you get like myopia and need glasses. And that's mm. why there's an epidemic of kids needing glasses because they're all indoors, they're not getting sunlight. And uh, in countries where they do get sunlight, like Australia, the rate of using glasses is very low because, mm. uh, you know, just so many benefits. So I think being in tune with nature, uh, in Ayurveda, they really emphasize like eating with the seasons, eating locally, you know, it was the very first like kind of eat local movement because you just eat what is freshly available, locally grown. And um, being outdoors, being in tune with nature, I think those are, are really key. Are there any Ayurvedic principles that are even sort of like, you know, classically maybe called old, old wives tales or sort of, mm -hmm. you know, that sort of thing that you feel are like maybe overemphasized in Ayurveda mm -hmm. at the cost of sort of some of the basics that are there. Like one that I often would hear mm -hmm. from my mom, you know, previously would be like, okay, you know, only drink at the end of your meal, mm -hmm. which, okay, great. And I understand from the world of Ayurveda, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Mm -hmm. Drinking during the meal, you're diluting the stomach acids that are there, and it's harder for your body to digest. If you drink at the end of the meal, it's less dilution of that. Mm -hmm. And I think that if that's true, I'd love to hear your take on that if it is. But if it is true, great. 
And I especially feel for like India right now, sometimes when I'll visit, I'll hear things like that or other mm -hmm. stuff from Ayurveda that are like left over. Yeah. And meanwhile, people are like gorging on sugar. Right, right? exactly. And yeah, it's like, okay, yeah. look, we right, want to right. take this in context. Yes. I don't think your diabetes is happening right. because you're drinking during your meal. Yes, right? I think yes, you're just exactly. overeating on carbohydrates right, right. and you're under eating on protein and healthy fats and other yes. stuff. Yeah. Well, there are, are areas where I disagree with some Ayurvedic principles. I think the, the topic of food combining and food combinations is another one that I disagree with, like the classical recommendations, for example, fruits should only be had uh, on their own. There are right. certain like incompatible you yeah, know, And you see foods. a lot of South Asians, unfortunately, yeah. and Indians and even some other communities that they literally start breakfast is yeah. fruit only by yeah. itself. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, it is true because Ayurveda says uh, fruit and, um, you know, the fruit sugars are digested rapidly and their, you know, protein is digested slowly. And that's why you should eat them separately. But I think that's actually why you should combine them because then it slows down the glycine effect. If you're combining the fruit with uh, a little bit of protein, a little bit of fat, um, it slows down the blood sugar spike. And, you know, in our modern world, like people don't have that kind of like insulin sensitivity that you need to be able to eat the Ayurvedic way where you just have fruits by themselves, you know, maybe, uh, you know, 50 years ago, but um, insulin resistance is so rampant that most people can't, can't do that. And then um, about the water with the meal. Yeah, that's very interesting. So, um, it is true, you dilute your enzymes a little bit, but um, there's also studies that show that um, having water before the meal means you eat less and then you lose weight because <laughs> <'cause laughs> it's basic, basic, simple, like, um, you know, space issue. You just fill up your stomach with like a glass or two of water. Um, that's called preloading the meal. Like you can, uh, you know, kind of uh, do that. And studies show people lose weight. So how many people are trying to lose weight, but that's a simple to a trick, right? You just drink water before the meal. And, totally. And I think yeah. it just goes back to this larger idea of don't major in the minor things. Yes. And let's yeah. make sure the basics, sleep, right. getting away from ultra processed foods, mm -hmm. having adequate protein, having adequate fiber, yep. a, you know, figuring out sort of the stress component in your life, surrounding mm -hmm. yourself with community, relationships, love, yes. you know, and, you know, there's a bunch of other basics inside of there too, strength training, you know, some movement. Mm -hmm. If those are not, oftentimes you'll be better off putting a little bit more attention to those yes. than finding that miracle supplement that's going to fix you know, right. the situation for you, which by yep. the way, there's a lot of supplements that actually can make a difference, mm -hmm. but there's never that one thing that can like, you know, fix it all. So let's make right. sure we attend to the basics. And then we do some of the stuff that could be supportive mm -hmm. in this process. So a, a big part of this uh, book it's the R in the Tiger Protocol. Mm -hmm. T is toxins, I yep. is infections, G is gut health, E is eat right, which we just mm -hmm. talked about a bunch, yep. also with the context of Ayurveda. Mm -hmm. And R is the rest that's there, which is a big part of our modern lifestyle is not very restful. And this is a mm -hmm. big part of why people feel like time is going by so quickly. Right. You know, I was telling you, I just got a group of, uh, of my friends together. Mm -hmm. There's a men's group that I'm part of in Los Angeles called Man Morning. Mm -hmm. And we meet every Thursday morning mm. and we go for a walk together. Good. And we talk about what we're celebrating in life and what we're navigating in life. You know, historically, mm -hmm. men are not very good at opening up about some right. of the challenges that they're going through. Mm -hmm. And all the guys in the group, you know, they're either authors, business owners, other stuff. And there's a lot of weight on their shoulders. They're dads, mm -hmm. et cetera. And if you want to be the best man that you can be, you know, this mm -hmm. group was really designed to like, how can we lift each other up? Yes. And one of the things we did is once or twice a year, we'll do a retreat. So we all did a mm -hmm. retreat and we didn't specifically say, put away your phones, but our calendar was filled with so much activity. We played sports. Uh, we were, it was pretty much like no alcohol that was there, mm -hmm. which was also really exciting. Okay. And then we had a lot of round table discussions and we, nice. sh and we broke bread together. Mm -hmm. And when your phone is away and you can actually rest and people often would take a nap during the day. Yes. Right? Even though they're yeah. young, healthy, fit, active, because mm -hmm. we had so much activity, they're taking a nap. Mm. Actually, what people were feeling, even though the retreat was only like a three-day thing, mm -hmm. by a day and a half in, it felt, felt like we had been there for two weeks. Nice, nice. In a good way. Yeah. Not in a bad way. Mm -hmm. Like I want this thing to end, but like, wow, it feels like we've done so much. It feels like we've been spending a, you know, a week or two weeks together. Mm -hmm. And that's part of what happens when we sort of lean into 
a good amount of rest and lowering stimulation is that actually I right. believe that time slows down and we can appreciate life. Mm -hmm. Now we can't always do that. You know, that a retreat is called a retreat right. for special purposes, but I think there are themes that when I was reading your chapter about mm -hmm. rest that we can extrapolate and try to bring into our life. So yeah. what do you tell your patients mm -hmm. about rest, especially in the context of them dealing with a chronic disease like an autoimmune condition? Um, yeah, I tell them to um, think about what really works for them in terms of stress reduction, in terms of a mind-body practice, because, uh, you know, I'm a huge fan of meditation. There's a lot of research on the benefits of meditation. You know, it uh, improves the size of your um, hippocampus. It uh, literally, like, changes the structure of your brain, your, you know, both gray matter and white matter. It's changing your brain waves. You have more gamma waves. Um, it's, like, physically changing your brain. Eh? This some Something so powerful. Uh, but not everyone is a fan of meditation. And the research shows that there's a lot of different ways to come at stress that are effective for autoimmune disease and in general. So it could be counseling. It could be, you know, finding the right therapist. Um, it could be mindfulness practice. Uh, for some people, it could be prayer. It could also be journaling. It could be um, guided imagery. So it doesn't have to be meditation, but find something that works that you can do every day uh, for at least 10 minutes. That's what I what I tell people. And for some, you know, they focus on either maybe like gratitude practice or spiritual practice or, um, or possibly physical activity. But um, I think um, finding like one technique that, you know, you, that suits you, that's effective for you, that you can do consistently, I think that is um, like the, the really uh, fundamental thing. And it's different for everyone. Um, and then the final point about stress uh, is that I found that the research on um, trauma and autoimmunity to be very compelling. So there is a, a list of what are called adverse childhood experiences that are you know super common in, in the US that uh, are associated with like three or four fold increased risk of autoimmunity later in life. And uh, so I think if there's uh, been trauma, then uh, addressing that, you know, therapy, counseling is really Somatic vital. work. Yeah many ways to tackle it have you there's there's really great like transformational organizations that are out there too like have you heard mm -hmm. of the hoffman institute oh yeah yeah it, yeah they, i think they're based up in the bay area a lot of people have really enjoyed that i haven't done it but i've done similar programs it's sort of mm -hmm. like helping you understand how you're you know everybody's got a little bit of trauma in their life yes even if people think they had like a great childhood and great you did have a good childhood mm -hmm. and there are things that we all internalize and there's right. different levels and spectrum of trauma that's out there right yep doesn't mean that everybody has trauma has been through something really bad yes. that's out there. And there are people that have gone through something really bad, but mm -hmm. the Hoffman Institute, from what I understand, um, and it's, it's pretty cost effective mm -hmm. uh, for people. It's a retreat where people go to become aware of the stories that they've told themselves about their previous experiences. Mm -hmm. That leads to a level where everybody has this ego where they decide what they're good at and what they're not good at. Mm -hmm. And then that our ego can have defense mechanisms. Yes. And that defense mechanisms can get in the way and we can have core beliefs that we developed as a child that still run the show. Mm -hmm. There are many people that have a hard time healing because they don't feel that they deserve it. Right, yeah. That mm -hmm. they deserve to be sick. Yes. And, or there's people that believe that they're not good enough, mm -hmm. right? Or they're not smart enough, or they're not this enough, or that they were never good enough and that's why everything came well, that everything came easy to everybody else, but it has not come easy to them. These beliefs right. get in the mm -hmm. way. And I think this is part of this work that's there. Meditation is great because sometimes yes. it can help you reflect on that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people can go through different programs. And I know that's one that a lot of my friends have done that they've really enjoyed. Mm -hmm. I have no affiliation with them. It's just you know one of the ones that, that's out there. Um, mm -hmm. I think you said something really key, which is 10 minutes every day. Yep. You don't have to go to a spa. You don't have to go spend hundreds of dollars on a massage. Yes. This just is even for some people, it could be as simple. This is my wife, mm -hmm. yeah. as simple as taking a bath, mm -hmm. yeah. Epsom salt bath, right? And sitting there, putting your phone away for a little bit, which yep. is so tough for people, yes, yes. but it's so important. Yep. And then giving your chance, lighting a little candle, just getting a chance to relax a little bit and mm -hmm. allow your nervous system to reset. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and I think, uh, you know, technology is uh, not going away, right? We all, it's a, it's a double edged sword, though. So we have to learn to, kind of harness it properly. And um, I think like the average American checks their phone 80 times a day. Um, and that's gone up just in the past five years. It was like 60 times a day <laughs> five years ago. So um, yeah, we need 
times where we can disconnect. We need to use technology mindfully. And uh, um, I think, um, you know, one of the psychotherapists in our clinic uh, does uh, what's called EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization and uh, reprocessing. And that has been shown in research to be very good tool for trauma as well of all types. So I'm a fan of that technique. So there are a lot of um, tools out there. I think you wanna see what speaks to you, what works for you and find something that you enjoy. There's a section in your book that I really appreciated you putting in and it's called what to do if you're not getting better. Yes. I think that I wish more books had this section. Mm -hmm. And so what do you want to say if somebody's going down the process of using your protocol in specific yep. and they're not finding themselves getting better and mm -hmm. they're looking for where they maybe gotten stuck, trapped, or what do they have to pay attention to? I think this is important for people to know early on because getting to the root mm -hmm. and addressing your autoimmune condition is a journey. Yes. Right? Yep. Mm -hmm. You don't just take out two foods and then you're better. Right, right. Often... I've heard this said previously by different practitioners, you know, how sick you were, mm -hmm. you know, is a big part of how long sometimes it takes. Yes. And if you've yep. been dealing with autoimmune condition for years, mm -hmm. it's not going to be maybe a month, two months, three months. Not that you can't feel significantly better mm -hmm. and it's different what makes people feel differently. There's people that feel 50% better just by making dietary changes alone. Yes, I'm right. sure you've seen that with many of your yeah. patients, right? Mm -hmm. So what do you want to say uh, that's relevant to this podcast right now for the audience about mm -hmm. what to do if you're not getting better? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I felt that was really a crucial element because, uh, you know, with autoimmune disease, there's the first line factors that are we kind of talked about. And then there's second line factors we haven't talked about yet that for some people are major obstacles to healing. And I think the philosophical uh, perspective is important that you have to be your own best advocate. You know, you have to really strongly advocate for yourself. My goal with all this information is to empower people, you know, to really have that hope, to have that knowledge where they can feel positive, they can feel like they're, they're their own advocate. And then, um, so some of these other factors I talk about, like if you're not getting better with the basic protocol, uh, is to l start looking into like other infections because there are, you know, literally like hundreds of infections that could be um, contributing. So um, things like chronic viral infections, chronic uh, bacterial infections, chronic Lyme disease, um, there's different things that can impede healing. Um, within toxins as well, there's many other toxins that could be a factor. Mold is yeah, a big one. Exactly. Yeah. So mold is the one that, um, yeah, there's actually interesting research that uh, uh, people who are exposed to a mold, uh, water damaged building with, with mold have a um, pretty significantly increased risk of autoimmunity over, um, you know, 10 years after that. And uh, it appears to be especially um, neurological. So uh, a lot of the antibodies that are more against the brain or the nervous system were increased in, in those who had been exposed to mold. So um, definitely an area to look into. And uh, um, I think, um, yeah, uh, mold is one of the like hidden factors that for some people, not everybody, you have to be genetically susceptible to it. You know, a lot of us are, are fine, not affected by mold, but for the we see the patients who are very sensitive and they can sure. they can tell the moment they walk into a water damaged building or um, they can tell when they go on vacation and they leave their house suddenly they're like feeling a lot better because mm -hmm. they're away from that environment um, so um, and then finally I think looking at the um, other unresolved um, emotions other stress other mind body factors as well is um, is worth pursuing yeah definitely. Uh, as we start to wind down here, you know, what are the most important things you want to leave people with about the mindset piece when it comes to getting to the root of your autoimmune condition? You know, th mm -hmm. that mindset piece, there's a lot of people that are out there that are listening that feel like yep. they've been suffering so long mm -hmm. that they actually are not sure if it can get better. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. well, what do you want to say to that yeah. person and any other important mindset pieces that are part of your Tiger Coat Protocol approach? Yeah, I think that's really crucial. And I think that the the first step in that is really believing that you can get better. And um, the unfortunate thing is, you know, many patients have been told by their doctor that they're not going to get better. And uh, it's a lifelong yeah. disease, you're just gonna have to yeah. manage it. Yes. And, uh, um, and sometimes, you know, when a, a patient sees me, they will say, like, I'm the first doctor that has told them that you can get better. And I think it's just starting with that 
point, which I believe is true for everyone. You know, you can heal in some way, even if you can't cure the disease, you can feel better. Um, there, I think healing is always possible and um, it just looks different for different people. But I think um, having that, the positive mindset that, you know, you want to really advocate for yourself, you want to feel empowered, you want to make choices that will start you on that path to feeling better. Um, I think that the, um, um, yeah, the, having the, the right mindset is, is key and not being overwhelmed by all the negative information because uh, it is true. There's a lot of toxins, there's a lot of infections, there's a lot of problems with our food supply, but we cannot let that be, um, you know, um, overwhelming to us because we still have to live our lives and do the best that we can, you know, with the choices we can make. I love it. Uh, Akil, this was fantastic. You know, we covered, uh, I think we've been more than two hours in. Oh, the really? Wow. I didn't yeah, realize. Yeah. 220. Oh, okay. The wow. headphones. I'm yeah. telling you, the headphones make it easier Love to talk headphones. for a period of time. Yeah. Yeah. Anything that you feel that we uh, missed uh, that you want to talk about? And if not, I would mm -hmm. love you to share a little bit more about, you know, obviously the book is available. People can yeah. pre-order it. By the time this is on YouTube, they'd probably be able to order it directly from yes. Amazon or wherever books are, the Tiger Protocol, an integrative five-step program to treat and heal your autoimmunity. But mm -hmm. you also have some, for the people that are listening on audio that are listening mm -hmm. right when this episode drops, I think you're doing like a book launch event and a few other things, right? Do you want yes. to mention that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, there, uh, through my website, uh, you can find out about these upcoming events, but- uh, Which is? Uh, so one is a, um, there's a- Oh, simple you're sorry, your website? Yeah. Oh, the website is, um, it's drakil.com. So D-O-C-T-O-R-A-K-I-L.com. And um, so one of them is a symposium on April 22nd about integrative medicine and nutrition. Um, and then there's a um, launch event that you and I will be getting together again for on May 9th with the, we're going to have Terry Walls, the other uh, expert on autoimmunity and Chris Kresser, who's a New York Times bestselling author, joining us for that uh, free event. Um, so I think, um, yeah, I think the, and the, the final point I want to make about the, um, the tiger protocol is that I think that, uh, um, there's a lot of, been a lot of emphasis on fermented foods and I am a fan of them and recommend them, but not enough on the prebiotic foods. Mm. And I, I think, uh, really, um, and knowing, you've seen that make a significant difference for people. Yes. The prebiotic foods. Yeah, absolutely. And really understanding the details, like what are the best food sources of polyphenols? What are the dozen foods that are high in inulin? You know, what are the three types of resistant starch? What are foods in each of those three categories? What are the arabinoxalans? You know, what are they? We can go on and on, but those are like what I've really emphasized in my phase two diet. And I think the prebiotic foods are the foods that are shown to boost the diversity mm. of the microbiome. And that's the real key for long-term health and longevity for reducing inflammation. So I think um, that's something I really want to emphasize is the, the prebiotic approach. Great. I love it. Between that and also the doubling down on talking about toxins, which I feel mm -hmm. you did in the book, I yep. feel like those in themselves, I mean, there's plenty more, but those are two big things that even if people feel like they've gotten guides before on autoimmunity, mm -hmm. that is a major shift on how you approach it, right? Mm -hmm. In combination with a bunch of other stuff that we teased out during the podcast, which were like not having too restrictive of a diet for people yes. that they can actually follow. That's a huge part of it. So Dr. Kill, thank you for coming down here. Okay. I really appreciate it. You know, this is a great chance to hang out together in person. Right. I've been a big fan of your work for a long period of time. And I feel like you have a really measured approach of showing people because of your clinical experience mm -hmm. on the pathway they can take to actually get better. And right now the world needs it. More and more people mm -hmm. are getting autoimmune mm -hmm. conditions. More and yep. more people are getting sick. And it's really, really unfortunate. But I can immediately mm -hmm. think of a few family members that would benefit greatly from having this book in their hands. So thank you oh. for your work. Well, yeah, thank really you so much, Drew. It was really a fun conversation. So thank you for having me on your podcast. Hey, YouTube, if you enjoyed what you just saw, keep watching for more great content on how to improve your brain and your life. You just don't see them convert into Alzheimer's disease. We see many, many people who are on prevention. We have not had any so far who have now converted and become demented.